there. But for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, it was supposed to was have another moved on from era. that. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. For the news that matters, for the opinions that matter, for the stories that matter, find me, Vanessa Feltz, every weekday at 4pm, only on Talk, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Well, a very good morning, an absolute pleasure to be with you here on Talk TV. I'm Peter Cardwell. Thank you for your company. I'm here between now and one o'clock and loads to talk about this Wednesday morning, including the Clapham chemical attacker Abdul Azedi, who won his asylum appeal, even though the judge thought he was being dishonest about his conversion to Christianity. This is something a number of asylum seekers appear to have done. But in this particular case, the sex offender Abdul Azedi, who's now dead, said that he thought the Old Testament was about Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I would have probably spotted that that was a major and very basic error. But that was in the Home Office documents. The Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has been forced into a mini reshuffle. This comes as uh, only a quarter of people say they're satisfied with the NHS. We love the NHS as an idea, as a concept. We feel it's a very British thing. There was even a Thanksgiving service at Westminster Abbey for 75 years of the NHS, but only 24% of people are actually happy with it. What do you think about that? Are you happy with the NHS? What sort of service have you received? 0344 499 1000. We've had two ministers resigning from the government, Robert Halfon, Education Minister, and James Heapy, the Armed Forces Minister, and almost one in five Conservative MPs have declared they won't be standing at the 2024 election. We'll be speaking to one of them, Paul Scully, in just a few minutes. And King Charles will attend an Easter service in Windsor and what will be his most significant public appearance since his cancer diagnosis. This is my show, but it's your show too. I want you to let me know your thoughts on all of the topics we're discussing today and maybe something we're missing as well. Whatever you want to talk about, let me know. I'll take as many calls, texts and tweets and WhatsApps now as well as I can between now and 1 o'clock. 0344 499 1000 is the number to call. You can text 87222 with the word talk in your text. You can tweet me at Talk TV, follow me at Peter Cardwell and you can send both voice messages and indeed text messages to WhatsApp 0344 499-1000, same number as the telephone number. So uh, that's something we're experimenting as well, those voice messages, 0344 499-1000. We'll also find out in just a few minutes why political correspondent Alicia Fitzgerald is a tool of Western imperialism. Stay with us here on Talk TV. Well, thank you so much for your company this Wednesday morning. Um, we're asking as well, Labour has a plan to impose a 20% VAT increase on private school fees. This has been criticised. We'll be talking to one head of a school a little bit later on. Do you make the sacrifice to send your kids to private school? Or maybe you think actually state schools are the way to go and maybe if private schools close, maybe that will drive up standards in the state schools. Or will that just put more pressure on those schools? Uh, it's a really interesting one because I was chatting to someone at the weekend actually who is a head teacher of a private school and she said look our fees are three four thousand pounds a term which is a lot of money of course it's a lot of money but she said look there are a lot of people who are making the sacrifice who are doing three jobs in some cases she talked about one particular parent who's a Tesco delivery driver on the weekends to earn a bit of extra cash actually to send his two kids to her school and she says if this 20% fat increase happens well actually that is going to mean that her school will close because there's just no headroom financially or actually maybe you think maybe these are just a bunch of middle class whingers or maybe they're actually people who are aspirational and trying to do what they can for the kids give them the best education where the state school equivalent may not be as good so is Keir Starmer taxing aspiration let me know what you think about that 0344 499 1000 
The Clapham chemical attacker Abdul Azedi has won his asylum appeal even though the judge thought he was being dishonest about his conversion to Christianity. We're going to talk to Ivan Sampson, the immigration lawyer, in a minute. But with me all morning is political correspondent Alicia Fitzgerald. Hello, Alicia. Lucky you. I know. Better than that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Listen, there are lots of very, very serious stories around today. The NHS is one. Uh, of course, we are seeing that a lot of people really just don't have the satisfaction in the uh, for the NHS that, that, that the government hope they do. 24%, I think it's the lowest uh, for a long time. It is, and this is not a sudden thing. This has been wearing down and down and down over the years as the NHS has struggled more, people, the waiting lists have got bigger, and people are just finding that they simply can't get a GP appointment ever. I mean, for a long time, many politicians and just many people in the UK will have said that the NHS was probably one of our crowning glories as yeah. a country. Loads of people were so proud of it. It was something that lots of people credited very much to our governments, previous governments, not so much this one, sadly. Um, and it was seen as just this, this kind of national treasure. But now, I think if you ask lots of people and even lots of politicians including Wes Streeting he's the shadow health secretary he's even admitted that it's definitely not something that we yeah. should be super proud of at the moment so a lot of work to be it, done. It, it definitely is reform well let me know what you think about that 0344 499 1000. Well, I want to talk now about the Clapham chemical attacker this is a really astonishing story the asylum judge who granted asylum to the Cam Clapham chemical attacker who was a, a, a sex offender as well he was granted asylum despite despite the judge concluding that he had told a litany of lies about various aspects of his life. So his conversion, Abdul Azedi's conversion to Christianity, was apparently genuine based on compelling evidence from a retired Baptist minister who the Times names today as the Reverend Roy Merrin. Now the judge's decision to grant the asylum came despite expressing concerns about the honesty of the appellant in uh, relation to Zazedi, in relation to certain aspects of his account. Some of the stuff that he believed or didn't believe, uh, I mean, a caseworker asked uh, Abdul Azedi, what is the Old Testament about? Abdul Azedi said, Jesus Christ. Now, any Christian, and in fact, many people who aren't even Christians, will know the basic fact that the Old Testament is not about Jesus Christ, it's about the fact the Messiah is coming, and the New Testament is, of course, all about Jesus Christ in many, many respects. Really, really uh, astounding. Uh, he was asked to name Jesus' main followers, and he could only name actually four of the disciples, and he named Simon and Peter as well, as with Simon was another disciple as well. Asked what God created on the third day, what did God create on the third day? He responded, Good Friday and Easter Sunday and Resurrection Day. I mean, this guy just didn't know the very, very basics about Christianity. Let's talk to an immigration lawyer, Ivan Sampson, who's with us. Ivan, thank you for joining me this morning. How can someone who clearly doesn't know the basics about Christianity say that he is a Christian and then that is ac accepted by a court and that person who is a sex offender is granted asylum? Yeah, I can answer, answer our first part of that. Look, it's a theological debate. I mean, the person crucified with Christ on the cross we know very much about Christ, and yet Christ said to him, you'll be in with me in paradise today. So that's a theological debate. Now, th what I want to talk about is the evidence. Sorry. What is the evidence? I'm, I'm, not talk I'm not getting into theology. I'm getting into basic facts about things like well, the Old the Testament not being is, about does Jesus. mean to be a Christian? That's the theological debate. You're saying that you must know about the Bible, and if you don't know about the, Bi not about the Bible, you can't be a Christian. Sorry, are, are I we, you, sorry am, I, am, I, am I in a dream here? Ivan, you're saying, I mean, these are basic facts. You're not asking, you know, tell me about theories and, you know, what is verse, you know, chapter 12, verse 13 of Revelation. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, what is the Old Testament about? I mean, if you don't know that and you profess to be a Christian, surely that's yeah. a massive red flag. Well, I, my response to you is this. The person crucified with Christ uh, on the cross um, didn't know anything about him. Nothing yes. at all. Yes. He knew nothing about the Old Testament. And yet Christ said to him on the cross, you will be with me in paradise today. So he was obviously a Christian, accepted as a Christian, knew nothing at all. So again, that's a well, theological well, debate. The thief on the so, cross converted to Christianity as a result of talking to Jesus on the, on the cross as they were both dying, having been crucified by the Romans. This is someone who had based his asylum. You cannot compare the two. Peter, the person, this is a theological debate. It's not a theological Christ debate. It's works. basic facts. No, it's basic facts. You could ask a Muslim. You could ask a Jew. You could ask a Hindu. No, 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 what no, is the no, Old Testament it, about? It, 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 it's a theological debate. It's not. It's not. It, it is, Peter. It's basic facts. Ivan, you're arguing black is white. That is nonsense. Well, okay. 
the judge looked at the, the evidence. The, the judge decides on the evidence. No matter what people say, well, the judge got it wrong and he, this guy wasn't a Christian. Well, look at the evidence. Well, the evidence says what this. He'd come into the UK in 2016. He'd uh, had his asylum application refused, lost his appeal. Sometime between 2016 and 2018, he converted to Christianity. Well, he said he did. The most yep. compelling evidence was the evidence of Reverend Merrin. That's what the judge looked at. So it's his fault. To, yeah, well, no, 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 no. I, I never said that. The litany of lies, uh, the judge in the round found his evidence to be consistent regarding the conversion. They may well have been lies on other matters. And he may not have known about the Bible and may not have known about, uh, about um, the Old Testament. Um, many Christians who are believers may not know about the Old Testament. That that's, was nonsense. The that's nonsense. That is nonsense. Evidence. Ivan, that's nonsense. Show me a single person in a church in this country who does not know that the Old Testament is not about Jesus. It's about Jesus coming in the New Testament. That is, well, that is Christianity 101. Well, the, the, the judge will look at the evidence. The most well, he looked at it. He, he, he was, he was told lies and he made the wrong decision because he let a sex offender into this country as an asylum seeker and then he went on to throw acid in someone in a, someone in two people's eyes. Well, let's talk about the sex offence because what the law says, if you're convicted about for an offence which carries more than 12 months imprisonment, that means you will be automatically deport, deported. Azidi received a suspended sentence, so he wouldn't have been deported on that. And that had nothing to do with his conversion. So, again, it's a theological debate. Dan. It's not a theological debate. debate. Ivan, you're wrong. It's the not a theological debate. debate. That's, that is well, incorrect. We have to agree to disagree on that. No, we're not, we're not agreeing evidence. to disagree. You're just wrong. Sorry. Okay. The compelling evidence, Peter, was the evidence of Reverend Merrin. And what he said was this. He had known him since 2016. He'd attended the Alpha course, regularly attended church, had been baptised, and he was evangelising with non-Christians with the church. Despite Over knowing absolutely nothing Christians. about Christianity because he wasn't a Christian, because he had duped the, uh, he had apparently duped the Baptist minister into this who then sent a letter. I mean, there are so you many people within well the church right. who are just, just useful idiots to these asylum seekers. You There's no well doubt about that. Right. You may well be right, Peter. He may well have duped the, the Baptist minister. But we're talking about the judge's decision and what the judge had in front of him. So I won't criticise the judge, like everyone's getting on the bandwagon. The evidence you won't criticise, sorry, Ivan, Ivan, sorry to interrupt you. You won't criticise the judge, even though he clearly made completely the wrong decision based on incorrect evidence that had he proved it at all, would have made, made very great sense that this person wasn't a Christian, shouldn't have been in this country in the first place, and should have been deported before he oh, uh, threw acid in people's I'm eyes. I'm glad you raised that. I'm glad you raised that. What should have happened was this chap should have been removed. The Secretary of State has powers to remove someone if their presence is not conducive to public good. The Home Office didn't do that. The Home Office waited. After his first Well, they kept appealing. I mean, look, I, I'm no, no fan of the Home Office in this. I'm not defending the Home, home Office. But he appealed three times. Well, after his, his second, uh, his first appeal, it was dismissed. He should have been detained and removed. The Home Office didn't do that. Uh, in respect of uh, the appeal itself, if they, my experience of Home Office appeals is that, and, and this is, uh, this is going back 20 years, Peter, what I've seen in these appeals, is that the presenting officers are ill-prepared. We, I, I have one case for the day. I've seen presenting officers with six matters for the day which they have to prepare. They're not properly trained, they're underpaid, and uh, they're overworked. So uh, I think if you had a good lawyer in this, it would have made mincemeat out of uh, Yazidi's case and the, 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 the Baptist minister. And that's another problem, is that the people representing the Home Office, I'm afraid, are, are just not up to the task. Yeah. Um, so, let's Listen, I, th I, think, I think there are a lot of uh, people who will agree with you, and I will agree with you, Ivan, on that point. Um, uh, can we talk to uh, the Keith and Leeds to see? No, we can't. Sorry. No, um, I just want to read out a couple of messages here mm. um, in regard to this. There's one from Anna who says, Your current guest is trying to justify his point in Christianity. He should not be allowed to talk about the Bible or our Lord J Jesus Christ, and has just disrespected the whole of Christianity. This needs to stop. I'm sick of how Christianity can be undermined at every junction. Well done, Peter, for demolishing him. Well, Anna, I, would, I respect Ivan's opinion, even though I completely disagree with him and think he's completely wrong. 
But at the same time, what is clear is that there is abuse in the system, Ivan, and, and as you correctly point no, out, uh, out about the Home I, Office... I, just, I won't dispute I, that. just want to finish my point, Ivan, if that's OK. People as on you, the Bibby Stockholm have claimed asylum on the grounds of religion. Um, and, and, that's, and the, the Home Office I'm a, need to be, uh, properly cross-examine the ministers giving evidence. The most compelling evidence is the ministers. Uh, and I'm a, they, they need to be properly cross-examined. Uh, and you'll note the minister who gave the, the uh, support for Zidi, it wasn't on behalf of the Baptist Church. He did it on his, off his own back. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps the Baptist Church should sanction it. Yeah, I think, I think we need... That, that, I think we need to look at that. There also seems to be a, a massive outbreak of Christianity on the baby Stockholm. Listen, that, that's OK. That's fine if people have, uh, if they genuinely believe these things. But the fact is that he didn't actually believe these things. Um, Keith is in Leeds and has given me a call on 0344 499 1000. Keith, uh, you're on the air. What would you like to say? You're very welcome to the programme. Do you know, I've just been watching Mr Cardwell and he, in a nutshell, has summed up everything that's wrong with our immigration system. It's the blinking lawyers stealing money off the poor people like us and making themselves into millionaires. But the, the, that, that, that three minutes was three minutes of pure delight for me because we finally got to talk to somebody that's part of the problem and not the solution. Let me put those points, Keith. Stay where you are. I'm going to put those points to Ivan. Do you accept that criticism, Ivan? Well, no, I don't, because I'd be very surprised if your callers read the judgment. OK, it, it, it's prejudices, I'm afraid. It's not I'm law. I'm not talking about it, the judgment. And, 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 well, have you read the judgment? I, I don't need to read the judgment. Well, I've just heard you talking to Peter Cordwell, and, and, and I'll tell you what... Just one at a time, one at a time. Sorry, Keith, go ahead. Your argument's not compelling, I, I, because I, you're not talking about the law. Oh, he's another Keith, what is he? What does the law say, and what is the evidential burden? What does that a person have to do? What does the law say... And how does the judge make a decision? And you'll remember the home but, office... But, the judge, but Ivan, Ivan, the judge made the rubbish. wrong decision here. The judge made the wrong decision here. Keith, what do you, Keith, make your point. Ivan, just let Keith speak. Keith, go ahead. My, uh, Ivan lives in a surreal world where money is nothing to him, and, but it's everything to us pensioners, and we're paying for the stupidest of people to go into a barristership uh, and, and I'm only saying this about these uh, these other lawyers, and I'm sure that, that there are some good ones there. But this man is talking absolute gibberish. In fact, it, if we imagine that you and he were in a court of law at this moment with what you came up with, his case would already be lost and gone. OK, Keith, thanks for your points. Um, Ivan, do you want to respond to that before I go on with the interview? Sure. Again, I mean, we can only... You, uh, uh, hindsight's a wonderful thing. And on the but, but, but the evidence hearing, was there at the time, Ivan. The evidence was there at the time that he wasn't a Christian. Well, well you say that he wasn't a Christian. You're making that judgment. The judge had a different it's, it's view. It's pretty obvious. It. It's, it's, it's obvious to a blind man on a galloping horse that this guy knew nothing about Christianity. He wasn't a Christian. It was pretend because he well, wanted to decide him in this country. We're going to on what it means to be a Christian. Does it mean you need to have factual evidence about the Bible, the people in it? Does that, it's that, basic that information. I'm not talking about really deep theological... You know, I, I know loads of people who have a simple faith. My grandmother was one of them who had a simple faith and did not know, perhaps, you know, every single thing about what was in Leviticus. I'm not expecting everybody who's a Christian to be a scholar of the Bible. I would be really interested if there's a single person in this country who calls himself a Christian, who goes to church, who doesn't know that the Old Testament is not about Jesus because Jesus wasn't born yet. That's what the New Testament is about. That is a basic fact. That is not a theological argument, Ivan. Now, the, what the judge says was the compelling evidence was the evidence of Reverend Merrin. Without that, he would have failed. I agree. But the judge put more weight on the evidence of uh, Robert Merrin having known him, having, having uh, had a relationship with him, to rely on his opinion, on his conversion. And the judge, the Reverend Merrin also said, also said that he'd given evidence on four other cases, all of which had been granted asylum on the grounds of Christian conversion. So that's what the judge gave the weight on. Now, if you say that's wrong in law, then the Home Office should have appealed it. And they I, I think, I think, I think this is... obvious to but, but everyone, I, Ivan, including okay. you and the rest of the world, why did the Home Office not appeal well, it? Well, I'm not, I'm not defending the Home Office. I, I, I totally agree with you, Ivan. The Home Office has a massive case to answer here. But what we've seen, 
what we're seeing in this case, and look, this is an extreme example. This person mm. was a sex offender. He then went on to be a chemical attacker. He threw acid in the eyes of two people, including a child. But what we're seeing in this case, and the fact this person was granted asylum, or at least got asylum, Ivan, is a microcosm of everything that is wrong with the asylum system. The home of, hold on, hold on. The Home Office screwed up. The expert witness, or witness giving a lot of very, very important evidence on which this hinged, was duped. The person, where well, there was basic evidence in regard to whether he was a Christian or not, those were lies. And the Home Office and the judge got it wrong. That is, many people will just see this case, will see this as, as an example of the asylum system in this country and say, it is broken. It is ridiculous. We are a compassionate country, Ivan. We're a country that take in people from lots of different parts of the world, like Ukraine, like Hong Kong. There are legal routes. There are ways in which we take people. People had uh, Ukrainian refugees in their homes. A friend of mine still does. But there are people like uh, Azedi, like Abdul Azedi, who absolutely extracted the Michael on this. And many people Andrew, who, I, who are I, paying their taxes I, think that's deeply unfair. I understand your point of view, and there'll be many people like Azadi who've probably been granted asylum on the on the similar similar cases. But th this is the Home Office are responsible. For... Well, the judge is responsible, and the Home Office, and Azadi, and the Baptist minister. Everyone involved in this case is responsible. I was going to say for removing people like that as quickly as possible, not allowing them to remain here for years on end afterwards allowing them to have uh, uh, accumulate private and family life here, allowing them to make further appeals, allowing them to do that. I mean, the Home Office should remove these people as soon as possible. They don't. And with regard to the church, I think the uh, ministers who give evidence should be properly cross-examined. I'm not sure this person was. He did give oral evidence, but I'm not sure to what extent he was properly cross-examined by the Home Office. Yeah. Again, that goes back to the Home Office not being properly prepared, not properly trained. Um, and not um, advocating uh, with the full force that they can. There's a weakness in the system. The Home Office is broken. We need a vital review of how the asylum system works. That I agree with you. OK, Ivan, thank you very much indeed. That's Ivan Sampson, who's an immigration lawyer. Thank you to him. Thank you also to Adrian Baird, who has been in touch on text to say, our churches seem more concerned with virtue signalling their own righteousness on matters in history over which they have no control, for example, slavery, rather than whether by present actions it puts lives at risk on the streets of this country. Uh, Sarah says, regardless of the Christianity claim, he should have been deported. It is not our responsibility whether he can openly practice his religion or not. David is in Uxbridge. David, you're very welcome to the programme. 0344 499 1000 is the number David has called. What would you like to say, David? Good morning. Hello. Um, basically, first of all, I'd like to say that you're absolutely right and the other guy is absolutely wrong. Thank you, David. Um, I'll explain why. Um, consider Jews, for example. Um, they are like booked into heaven already, okay? So then it's not a question of being Jewish. You're not going to heaven, you're going, okay? Okay, um, that, that's what they believe, yeah. The, the guy on the cross, Jesus knows the heart of the guy. He knows he's repentant. Yes. And also the guy on the cross is aware of who Christ is. Uh, and therefore the, the consequence of that is you're in, you know? Yeah. That's the thing, it's the recognition of who Jesus is yes. and what he means, okay? Yeah. Now, my, my belief about Jews is that on the end, at the end of times they'll just say, call oh, blimey, you're right, right after all, and then they're all in, you know? So okay, that's okay. Kind of it. So you don't need to worry about that. But um, there's a sort of mentality creeping into society now, and it's, it's an extreme form, form of Stockholm Syndrome, which I call the Zonda Commando, mentality where they're actually becoming part of the the problem okay all right we're going to leave it there because we've got to move on but listen thank you okay thanks david uh, thanks for your thoughts um amanda has been in touch okay cheers david um amanda has been in touch on um taxing private schools as well we're talking about this as well uh, she says taxing private schools is ludicrous a policy of spite and envy which will only flood the state system which is drowning as it is what do you think about this let us know your thoughts 0344 499 1000 uh, paul says labor ruined grammar schools the first uh, um gs prime minister wilson took them apart what does gs mean uh took them apart now uh, starmer and his cronies will ruin the private school sector with envy and tax uh, punishing 
hardworking parents. I said grammar school, grammar school prime minister was uh, Wilson, took them apart. Now Starmer and his cronies will ruin the private school sector with envy and tax, punishing hardworking parents. I sent my kids to private school. It was like having two extra mortgages. This is only the start of the real nasty, spiteful party, Labour, God help us. Well, that's a really, really interesting point because Paul is not someone who, I'm going to take a punt here, I don't know, but I would imagine Paul did not send his kids to Eton or Harrow or somewhere like that. And actually, what pe when people think and characterise private schools and the huge fees that we're talking about, 50 grand and things like that, that is not what most people pay when they send their kids to private schools. I went to a state school, I was lucky, I didn't go to a private school, I had a fantastic education in the state sector, but I totally understand, I would never condemn anybody for sending their kid to a private school, and it is a big, big sacrifice that many people make. Alicia Fitzgerald is still with me. Alicia, um, two big issues. Um, I, I just thought I was in purgatory there with Ivan. I mean, he was just kind of arguing black was white there, I'm afraid. And part of that interview, the rest of the time, he made perfect sense. Yeah, I mean, I have a few things to say. I don't even know where to start with that. But I think the main thing that I take away from that is that no one's arguing that he didn't convert to Christianity. I think Ivan was saying, well, there was proof from, from the Baptist that he converted. Yes, we know he converted, but does that mean that his conversion was for actual personal reasons that he wanted to change his and, religion. And was he in any way sincere or was this just a mechanism to get him asylum? Exactly. Which I, think it, the, I think we can completely understand that it was. Exactly. And I think the second thing I would say to that as well is is Ivan's claim about, you know, not all Christians know about the what the Old Testament is. He claimed he read the Bible every day for three years. Right. <laughs> I, I didn't think know that. that's yeah. a, you know, I, I would hope you if, would have if picked you're it reading up. something every day. You would have picked it up. Yeah. You'd be like, okay, so the first half is not about Jesus. It's not about Jesus. Second half actually about Jesus. I mean, it was just, sorry, that was that was through the looking glass. Ivan, very good to come on and he, he made he made points I agree with in other parts of his interview, but um, that was that, that was just nonsense, that bit. Um, we're going to talk in a minute because the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, has been forced into a mini reshuffle. Two ministers, Robert Halfon, uh, Education Minister, and James Heapy, he's been on the station many times, both of them actually. Uh, James Heapy was an Armed Forces Minister until yesterday. Both resigned from the government and will stand down at the next election. Almost one in five Conservative MPs are standing down. We're going to talk to one of them, Paul Scully, next here on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. 
The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22, mm. we was supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. Well, thank you so much for all your thoughts on a rather, a rather, rather strange uh, start to the programme, must be said, when Ivan Sampson was arguing that it was a theological matter whether an asylum seeker, who later went on to throw acid in two people's eyes, blinding a woman, that when he was quizzed about the Bible, which he said he read every day for three years, he didn't know that the Old Testament wasn't, didn't feature Jesus, and the New Testament does feature Jesus, which is um, incredibly basic knowledge. Um, thank you to Richard in Truro. He says, why don't we say religion will have no bearing on your asylum status, job done? Well, Richard, that's part of the problem, because what is happening, and the reason, and I probably should have mentioned this earlier, if people don't know, the reason that people mention their, uh, their religion is because they want to uh, stay in this country and they'll say, look, if I'm a Christian, you can't send me back to where, wherever the country is they've come from because of religious persecution. Um, listen, we'll continue to talk about this, um, but now I want to talk about politics because there's lots going on. There's a mini reshuffle. Two ministers have left. We've got almost a third of Conservative MPs stand, saying they're standing down at the next election, which I believe will be on the 14th of uh, November, but we'll see what happens. Paul Scully is the Conservative MP for Sutton and Sheen. He's standing down at the next election. He's a former minister and a very good one too. Um, Paul, um, why are so many people standing down? Um, it, do they just see the writing on the wall and terrible decisions of the Conservative Party, for example, not making you the candidate to be Mayor of London? <laughs> well, in the morning, Peter. Morning. Is, what, what a great leading question. No, in terms of <laughs> In terms of that, that obviously did, you know, have a bearing in my in my particular role because I'm just looking at London, thinking, uh, you know, we have to have a really credible campaign for London. Londoners deserve that. Uh, there are nine million Londoners that are being failed by Sadiq Khan. I think people are making different decisions. For me, it wasn't about whether I win or lose my seat and uh, just jumping before I get pushed or something like that. I think if I ran a good campaign, I would win, uh, not easily, but uh, but but it's it's what happens over the next five years. And I was never going to retire as a politician shuffling around in my 80s. So I was probably going to leave next time anyway. So if I'm not going to be part of the long term solution for the for rebuilding the party, then it's probably better to leave it to others to uh, to, to fill that gap. That was my theory. Uh, and those are perfectly reasonable personal reasons, Paul, very logical. But there's certainly the overall impression of so many people leaving and two very loyal ministers in James Heapy and Robert Halfon standing down. There is this sort of rats deserting the sinking ship. John yeah. Curtis, <laughs> Professor Sir John Curtis, who is the sort of doyen of polling, saying there's a 99% chance that Labour will be the next government. Yeah, and, and, you know, statistically, if you look at the polls, that's exactly what the polls are telling us. And there's a long way to go for that um, that narrow path that we described a year ago uh, to, to, to victory. That path is... You don't honestly right. think that'll happen, Paul, do you? No, but uh, no, that's what I'm saying. That's what yeah. we saw about a year ago. That path was narrowed and narrowed and narrowed. And there is that 1%, but you're not going to bet your house on 1%, are you? Sure. So, um, you know, Rob and James are brilliant ministers. There is a, there is an oddity. If you look at 2010, when it was uh, looking like uh, we were going to win, there was something like 100, I think, uh, Labour MPs that stepped down at that time. Because what you also have, when you talk about ministers, not only do you have to look at what you're happening at the election, and it is a brutal thing at the election, they've got to work out what they do next. Mm. And we've got all that, the rules in there that are understandable rules for transparency and openness. They've actually said, I've got to get every single job that I might want to do. And if I want to do a, a portfolio career or something like that, I've got to get that approved by a committee for two years after I leave office. And that committee doesn't want to stop me going to work, but there is a level of bureaucracy, and as I say, understandable bureaucracy. So there's loads of factors that we have to think just to have a life after politics, to be able to pay the bills and those kind of things. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you, you talked about statistics there. I want to ask you about another statistic, quite a shocking statistic. Example of 3,374 people. So this is bigger than most polls. And in, in uh, 2010, 70% of people said that they had faith in the NHS and they were happy with the NHS. Now it's 24%. That's not exactly a ringing endorsement of the Conservative Party's handling of the NHS in the last 14 years. 
I think what you've got to look at with all of this, whether it's the NHS, whether it's the economy, you've got to put it into the wider context. And uh, and, and the fact is that, um, you know, we, the only reason that we've managed to keep the NHS going as it is, even under the pressures that it is now, is because we started to pay down the debt after the global financial crisis it, um, when we took over in 2010. We then put out £408 billion, pounds, that's nearly half a trillion pounds worth of support uh, during COVID, and then a further amount of support during energy. And so we've got record amount of money going into the NHS because we've done that, uh, that but, ground. But, but, it, but it's also not working, Paul. And you're, you're, absolutely, no, you're, you're absolutely right to say that, you know, wh wh I, think, I, think, I think the figure in 2010 was £139 billion a year for health and social care in England and Wales. Now it's something like £180 billion. I mean, that is a huge amount of money. It's still less per capita than some countries spend on the NHS. But we have 91% of people saying it should be free at the point of use. We're spending £180 billion a year on it, but it's still not working and people are just not... Those no, no, it proves the point that you can't just throw money at a problem like the NHS. Yeah. The massive problem that you actually have to del delve deeper in it. And I remember the Treasury ministers at the last spending review when they were talking about, uh, you know, they were wanting to increase the NHS budget, but they said, we want to know where the money is going mm -hmm. because it, it's, it seems to be like swimming through treacle to get to understand really the uh, you know the the, um, the the budgets of the NHS and exactly what what productivity gains you're getting for spending money we all want an NHS that works we've had as i say it's not been helped because of covid and they're still playing catch up from that so uh, you know we, we we can put money into there but we've got to get the staffing right we've had strikes obviously over the last year we've got to get the backlog down post covid all of those are extraneous factors that no matter what happens with, with money, these are really two big situations that have happened in the NHS that we are playing catch up with. And the next government is going to be doing exactly the same thing. They're not going to turn it around overnight. Wes Streeting, who is probably going to be the next health secretary, uh, is the Labour shadow health secretary, says, uh, Paul, that uh, the NHS is a, a service, not a shrine. Uh, I expect you believe that too. How much is opposition to reform a major problem in the NHS? Because as you say, it is just not about money. Yeah, I mean, there, it's interesting when Wes says things like that, and he's also talking about learning stuff from the private sector as well. You know, he is effectively saying things that, frankly, as Conservatives, we just can't say and uh, without people, you know, jumping down our throats. And uh, 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 and so sometimes we can be too scared of our own shadow by saying things that, that absolutely need to be said. And that's one of the reasons that nothing ever changes. Having said that, in the NHS, I think you can look at the fact that um, there's been something like, uh, you know, 70 odd re reforms, uh, reorganisations of the NHS in its lifetime, and it's only just over 70 years old. So uh, there's always some reform, but it's not always meaningful. It's big. It's almost look, look busy, the boss is watching, but you're <laughs> not starting from base principles. I want to ask you about um, the fact that Rishi Sunak was at liaison committee yesterday, and this is a committee of all the different uh, heads of the select committees as a sort of super committee. Let's just watch a clip of him talking about small boats and immigration in this country, another thing that a lot of Talk TV viewers and listeners are very, very concerned about. We have to have a system which says if you do come here illegally, having crossed through multiple safe countries on your way, um, uh, then it's reasonable that we detain you and remove you to a safe alternative. Let's just forget what are we doing here. We, we are making sure that people are looked after. They will be safe. That will either be in their home country, whether if that's appropriate for them, or Rwanda um, or other alternatives down the line. You know, that is a policy which is reasonable, it's fair, and will ensure that we can break the cycle of criminal gangs, continue to welcome refugees here who we want to provide that uh, sanctuary for, um, and stop people dying needlessly. I mean, we've heard a lot of this uh, language from Rishi Sunak previously. The boats are down a little bit, but they've gone up again. We've had record numbers coming across in recent days. Um, Paul, uh, does the Prime Minister have given up? No, he hasn't given up, but it's a huge problem. I mean, it's a massive, intractable problem that he's got to deal with. And uh, it is frustrating that we're sort of um, dying on a hill about a problem that is, um, frankly, needs a, a, a longer term. Was solution. it wrong to say he would stop the boats? Um, well, I think it was just one of the ones actually um, that was the, probably one of the hardest ones of the five pledges to actually achieve. When you're saying stop the boat, you can yeah. reduce the numbers, it's actually. But is it ever but, achievable? Well, probably not in 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 in, to in its total. But what you can do, you have to have a robust system uh, that actually removes the pull factors. That's why Rwanda is is important. It's important, but it's one stage. It's not 
a complete solution by any stretch of the imagination. It's a huge amount of money for a few hundred people. I mean, do you, um, but it's not about the people. Yeah, but it's not about the people that are actually even on the plane. It's about the deterrent factor. If you were sitting there at the moment, and you're looking at where you're going to go, and I heard the, the tail end of your uh, last um, uh, comments uh, when you talk about France, as a, you know, and 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 and, and these kind of areas. France is a safe country. You want to stop people coming over there. But at the moment, they're seeing the UK as a place that they can come and join their families. Uh, they have diaspora groups over here that they can uh, that they can um, join. And if they are able to get here illegally, a number of them can disappear off into the black economy. Uh, and they are that's the hole that we've got to plug. Um, but they and that we can plug those holes. And um, you know, in terms of stopping the boats in their entirety. That's a sort of theoretical question, I suppose. But what we got to do? Well, why then have a slogan "Stop the boats," Paul? Sorry. Why then have a slogan "Stop the boats"? Many people. Well, no, that's what I'm saying. I yeah. think when he when he launched it, you know, as I say, he, you know, the, he he launched it in a wider sense. But then you've got a slogan there, and it, if you boil everything down to slogans, you're never going to get anything done, frankly, because you, all of these problems, whether it's the NHS, whether it's the immigration, whether it's the economy, of course, they're always nuanced. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about China because uh, Rishi Sunak was asked about that as well at Liaison Committee uh, yesterday. Let's have a look at that. Our approach to China is undoubtedly more robust than I'd say most of our allies, in fact. And so, uh, I mean, the Prime Minister talking there about the threat from China. Do you think, Paul, that China should be designated as an official threat to this country? I think you've got to just. Um, I don't have enough of the evidence to actually to to weigh uh, both sides to make a final decision. I would want to look at it really, really carefully. Why is that? Because something like fifty percent of the goods that we import are from China. We've obviously got to uh, have sense of our trade relationship with China, but we can't do that at the expense of our national security. And so, when we had our uh, the refresh of our integrated review, we're looking at our foreign um, foreign affairs policy and trade last year. We looked at exactly this and trying to strike the right balance. But I wouldn't want to just sort of like, you know, say now I'm going to strike a pen through that threat now without understanding where the what the re repercussions of that on our trade and wider um, situation would be. Final question, Paul. You have a few months left as an MP. Are you checked out or do you still have things you want to do? No, no, I've got to, uh, you know, it, I, one of the things I wanted to do in Sutton was build a new hospital and I want to make that irreversible. It's not clearly not going to get built in six months. So I want to get planning permission, business plan uh, at least underway there so that I, I can go away saying, you know what, that is um, that that is something I pr promised to campaign for and it's going to get done. In terms of um, uh, uh, the nation and the, and the party, I want to make sure I can leave as orderly as possible. So I've got a successor in Sutton that we, we, we can... I can help the party, the parliamentary party, really sense check what they are doing so yeah. that they're not just going to jump into some ideological um, uh, self navel gazing for the next five, ten years like they did in 97. OK, thank you, Paul uh, Scully, uh, MP for uh, Sutton and Cheam. Uh, for the next few months, anyway, he's standing down. Uh, I thought that was an extraordinary interview, Alicia. I thought he was just very, very honest. And, I mean, I don't want to say that he's demob happy or checked out or anything like that. I don't think that's the case. But I, I, I've rarely done such an honest interview with a politician. What did you think? I totally, totally agree. And I think that's a bit of a trend we're seeing at the moment, not just amongst politicians that are standing down, actually. Just I feel like lots of them have just maybe felt some sense of frustration over the past few years and just feel like now they are fed up of just having to kind of go with the status quo and follow the party line and lots of people I've noticed are becoming a lot more outspoken recently yeah. and I definitely think Paul was doing that. Yeah, I agree with you. Thanks as well on the uh, migrant uh, story that we've been covering. Mick has been in touch on Taxi at 7222. He says, you have exposed the immorality of the migrant industry. Mr Sampson has no concern for public safety, only smart aleck legal argument. Well, I'm sure Ivan Sampson would say that's not true, but thank you for your comment. Mike says, the private school my children go to provide two free places per year uh, uh, for underprivileged children. They provide uh, sporting facilities to other schools, they network other local state schools and uh, recently they have started a Schools Together rowing initiative. We pay around £14,000 and have two jobs and I have two jobs to pay the fee. So yes, they should have charitable status. So that's someone, Mike, disagreeing with uh, Keir Starmer's plan to increase fees on private schools, 20% that. Uh, Amy is in Stratford-upon-Avon. I think she has a strong view on this too. Um, Amy, you send your kids to private school? Yeah, I sent my daughter to private school and now my two stepchildren both go to private school. How do you fund that? 
Um, well, thankfully now I'm you know, affluent enough to be able to pay the fees. But when I first started as a single mum, I was broke and still chose to find the money somehow to send her to private school. And as I became more successful, um, I still chose to do that and opt out of all other public services where I didn't need to create a creative strain on you know the, the services that, that we have. But you, you clearly made some big sacrifices, Amy. We're not talking about the people who go to Eton and Harrow and things like that. No. We're, we're talking about people like you who have worked really hard and they want to aspire, they want to make sure that their kids have the best kind of education. Was the state school just not, not good enough? You just weren't happy to send your kid there? It was also a family choice. My daughter went to the same school that I went to. My mum worked full time so that I could go to that private school. You know, it's just it's a personal choice and not one that is tax deductible. I have to I had to earn and still do have to earn over 40 percent more than the fees that I'm paying. And I still choose to do that. I don't get a tax deduction for opting out. And I work in an industry where I can also I, I work in music. So the copyright law means I can actually put a lot of my money offshore and all of that. If you're a full tax paying resident in the United Kingdom, you have English staff paying PAYE, you're opting out of every public service that you know how to as not to strain. Why are we being added VAT onto something that is a And, and that's what that's what Keir Starmer wants to do. Amy, just let me ask you one final question before we go to the break. Um I mean it, it it's fascinating that so many people are getting in touch about this. This really is an issue that I thought had to be debated. Um, but you must be, feel doubly annoyed that not only are you paying through your taxation for a state school place for your child that you're not taking up, you're earning more money you know, and working hard to do so to send them to a private school, and there is now the prospect of that on that as well. Yeah, it's a triple, it's a triple threat. You don't get the free service. You have to pay for the service you do want, but you have to also earn double what that costs in order to take home the balance to be able to then, after tax, pay the school fees. Some people will say you don't have to, though. You could send your child to a state school. Well, I don't have to have private health care or NHS care. You know, these are personal choices. Yep. And a lot of people, Keir Starmer is underestimating and seems to classify anyone who earns, you know, a decent amount of money in the UK as some kind of off-dom you know, idiot. And that's not the case. Some people are real upstanding citizens in the United Kingdom and we've made choices and those choices should be allowed to stand, especially when they're relieving the public system. Amy, thanks. Really good points. You're definitely not an idiot. Thank you very much. That was Amy in Stratford upon EF and we're going to continue this debate and talk about the Royals next here on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, missing. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that was oh, the best one. a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> 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 yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. 
Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Loads of people getting in touch about VAT on private school fees. I was. This comes out of a conversation I had with the school head at the weekend. I was just chatting to her on an event and she said, look, the people who send their kids to our school, no, this isn't Eaton and Harrow, this isn't 50 grand, this is people paying three, four thousand pounds a term, which yes, it's a heck of a lot of money, uh, especially after tax, but Starmer wants to put up put VAT on private school fees. He thinks it'll raise 1.9 billion. There are a lot of people who really make a sacrifice. We've had lots of messages from people who are doing two, maybe three jobs to send their kids to private school because the local state schools in the area are not what they are happy with. Um, so there are, there, you know, there's a lot to talk about on this. Um, so, and we're asking the question today to you. Labour, <coughs> excuse me, Labour's plan to impose taxes on private schools has been criticised. Is Keir, Sir Keir Starmer taxing aspiration? Uh, Sam says Starmer is going to put a tax on everything and follow on with Tory policies. Wick has been in touch to say if they're private businesses for profit, they should be taxed like any other. Chris says, of course Labour will. Labour MPs' kids will be exempt, naturally. I don't think that can be the case. Uh, Belinda says, I worked two jobs to get my girl through private school and have left a place free in a local school for another child. John says, tax aspiration to give it to the work shy. That's Labour's way. Jane says, it's all tax, tax, tax and nothing going the other way. It's cuts, cuts, cuts. It's enough to make your blood boil. Jonathan's been in touch. He says, Keir Starmer's got more faces than the Big Ben clock. He couldn't run a bath, never mind the country. Vote reform. It's our only answer at the moment. Dave says... All that will happen is that parents who can just afford to do, just about afford to do this, will take their kids out and put them into state schools, bigger class sizes, less revenue for the government. It's a moronic idea. Well, we're actually talking to uh, a private school uh, head teacher a little bit later on. Um, Alicia Fitzgerald is with me all morning. She's political correspondent of this station, but she's also commenting on all the different issues. What do you make of this plan from Keir Starmer? Because he would say that actually this is a fair thing. Private schools are something that the Labour Party has been toying with for so long now. At one point they were going to abolish them completely. In fact, really quite recently, I believe, that wasn't so long ago that they were saying they wanted to get rid of private schools altogether. And the, the kind of issue with that was, if our state system isn't up to scratch at the moment, where are these pupils going to go and what's going to happen there? This is just the same thing. And the trouble is, is Labour have this kind of association of taxing aspiration and stopping aspiration and this only really furthers that doesn't it if you're trying to say to people who work really hard to send their children to private schools whether or not you agree with private schools is totally a different subject they do exist they're going to exist yes. for the time being there's not a viable alternative to them at the but, moment but also the part of the debate is should they actually have to exist no because the you, know, <laughs> you know because the state you know the sort of sam if you're a fan of the west wing as i am political nerd i know you've seen it as well this year mm -hmm. sam seaborn talks about you know schools should be palaces children children should be treated brilliantly you know uh, teachers should be paid fortunes and so on but that's just not the case there are so many problems in so many aspects of our society but not least our creaking state schools definitely and that's and i think the last caller made a really good point about this it's like saying you know realistically private health care shouldn't need to exist because the nhs should be so good that everyone can use it and it's yeah. really up to scratch that should be the ideal world in, in an ideal world but, but often, it's not realistic at the just, moment sadly often just not the case well we're going to talk about the royals now because after uh, hagen is with me royal Con commentator great to have her on and the Duke of Sussex as we reported yesterday has been named in a 30 million dollar US lawsuit alleging that Sean Diddy Coombs he's a rapper uh, used his name to give uh, sex trafficking parties legitimacy there's no suggestion obviously whatsoever that the Duke of Sussex Prince Harry attended any of these parties but Rodney Jones who's known as Lil Rod who's a record producer has accused uh, Sean Coombs of a litany of sexual assault allegations and this is a 73 page 
lawsuit against the rapper and several of his associates and record labels filed in New York last month. Afio, what do you make of this? My, I, I reported this yesterday when it was breaking news and my Twitter absolutely lit up. Mm. And this is a prime example of someone using someone else's name to drag them, you know, into a situation that's pretty sordid, to say the least. I'm really glad you said there in your intro that uh, Prince Harry has not been accused of anything. His name is only mentioned once, and it's an example of the type of people that perhaps P. Diddy wishes he has associated with. So the actual uh, sentence uh, in the lawsuit says something like... Um, you know, uh, it was his VIP associations with celebrities such as famous athletes, political figures, artists, musicians, and international dignitaries like British Royal Prince Harry. That's the only time it's mentioned. Uh, and also, obviously, there's been pictures. We've seen lots of oh, this particular picture of Prince Harry with P. Diddy and Kanye West. Uh, Prince William was also there as well when they met. That was backstage at the concert for Diana in 2007. Um, so there is no uh, indication at all that Prince Harry was ever involved in any of these allegations that have been made against P. Diddy. And we have to say that P. Diddy denies all these allegations. Uh, but it shows what happens when somebody wants to drag someone's name into something. Yeah. When he wanted to use his association with the British royal family that he didn't have in any way, shape, or form to try and drag people, you know, into this circle, into this circle that he has. Mm. Now, what's happening with P. Diddy at the moment can only really be described as his comeuppance. There have been rumours for years about the things that he has been up to. Of course, I will say that he denies all these allegations, but in November, we had that lawsuit that his ex-girlfriend Cassie um, filed against him that he settled the very next day. And the details of that lawsuit were pretty grim. No, imp implied um, that she was raped, that she was made to sleep with male sex workers, that she was made to carry a gun, and he settled the very next day. Something, and that tells you all you need to know. Something uh, that is perhaps uh, brighter is that the King and Queen are going to attend an Easter Sunday service at St George's Chapel in Windsor Castle. Just very briefly, Afu, it'll be good for people to see the King who's been suffering from cancer out and about. It absolutely will be. You know, there was he was really, really hopeful that he would be able to attend some version of an Easter Sunday service, and he is going to do that this week. So it means the King and Queen will be leading the royal family at that particular Easter service. We won't see the Wales there. They are taking some time out. But it will be great for people to see the King out and about. And like Queen Elizabeth II once said, you have to be seen to be believed, and he is really, really keen on doing that. So, yeah, it will be great okay. for him, actually, to be out as well. Okay, that's Afu Hagen, their royal commentator, both seen and believed. Um, so thank you very much indeed to her. We're coming up in the next hour. We're going to talk about the BBC licence fee plans and what you think about that. Labour's private school plan will be interviewing a head teacher of a private school who's really, really worried about the VAT increase proposed by uh, Keir Starmer if he becomes Prime Minister. Let us know your thoughts on that. 0344 499 1000 is the number to call. You can get your call in during the break. Let us know what you think about this important issue. Back after the break. Stay with us here on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, missing. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. The stories that matter. Find me, Vanessa Feltz, every weekday at 4pm, only on Talk, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Very good morning, I'm Peter Cardwell. This is Talk TV. Thank you so much for your company. I'm here between now and one o'clock and we've had a very lively first hour uh, about, uh, talking about the theological aspect of knowing that the Old Testament is not about Jesus. Well, it's about the coming of Jesus, but he's not in it because that's what the New Testament's all about. Very weird uh, conversation earlier on. We're talking about the royals as well, but we're talking about the big issue as well today. Labour's plan to impose taxes on private schools. It's been criticised. Is Sir Keir Starmer taxing aspiration this hour i'm going to talk to a head teacher of a private school and we'll take some reaction from you at the moment pam from northumberland is on the line we'll get her in a second and the bbc's director general tim davy he's acknowledged the current tv license fee needs reform and is apparently considering plans to guess what make the rich pay more what do you think of that should rich people pay more should poor people pay less do you agree with the license fee as a concept let me know your thoughts 0344 499 we'll be talking to someone in just a minute who's, who has written a book called How Do We Pay for the BBC After 2027? We'll find out from John Mayer. Scotland's controversial new hate crime laws are set to become law on the 1st of April. Harry Potter author J.K. Rowling has dubbed it the mother of all April fools jokes amid fears the legislation could be used to prosecute comedians and women's rights campaigners. And the Labour leader, as I said, criticised on VAT and private schools. We're going to be talking about that in just a second. I want all your thoughts. Pam's giving me a ring on 0344 499 1000. I'm going to talk to her in a second. That's the number you can call too. So you can do three things with this number. You can ring me to make uh, to come on the air and talk about it. A number of people have done that. We'll take as many calls, texts and tweets as we can between now and one o'clock. And you can also send me a WhatsApp, a text message WhatsApp, but you can also record a short message, about 30 seconds is about right, 30, 40 seconds, and we can play that on the air. We did that on Sunday. And the number for all those three things is 0344 499 1000. You can text me on 87222 with the word talk in your text. You can also tweet me at Talk TV and follow me at Peter Cardwell. Let's spend the next couple of hours together here on Talk TV. So Labour's plan to impose taxes on private schools, Keir Starmer wants to not wants to put 20% VAT 
on private school fees. I was talking to someone at the weekend about this and who runs a, a private school. It's not it's not about people paying tens and thousands of pounds, huge, uh, you know, people who send their kids to Eton, Harrow, the Winchester, those kind of places. They can afford it. I'm not worried about them. The people I am thinking about are people who do two or three jobs sometimes to pay those fees, to go the extra mile to send their kid to private school. Is this a tax on aspiration that Sir Keir Starmer is putting forward. Loads of people getting in touch. Terry and Ramsbottom is one of them on text. Putting up taxes on private schools will cause those parents who can only just afford the fees to move their children to state schools, adding to the cost of the state school system. You can comment on YouTube as well. A number of people have done that. Alex says, from the frying pan into the fire, Labour will be the final nail in the British coffin. And Mark says, if posh school fees can be afforded, then so can paying more taxes. Martin says, the people who have sent their kids to private school have paid for the places at state school anyway through taxation. What is the thinking behind this policy? Or isn't there any? Gary says, why can't the working class have aspirations? Very good point. Let's ask Pam in Northumberland. The number she called is 0344 499 1000. Pam, you're very welcome. Good morning to you. I, I think you send your kids to private school or have done, is that correct? No, no, not at all. Uh, but I've had friends do it. But I'm a big defender of, um, you know, the people make, make these choices. Yeah. And I'm with you. An awful lot of families make enormous sacrifices and live very frugal lives to do this. You know, they don't do holidays. They don't do new cars. Um, and, and, and I think, well, what is wrong with the Labour Party? I mean, I also remember years ago with Diane Abbott. Her son went to private school. And I remember also um, she was challenged. Yeah, well, she, um, she, she said she was against on. private schools, yet send That's her kid right. to one. Yeah. yeah. What, what was the reason behind her choices if she was so concerned? Why didn't she work harder for more resources, resources into all the local comprehensives? Mm. We never got an answer. Mm. But, you know, people are already paying the tax for this and they have no benefit. You know, we each have our council tax, a part goes to the education department. We each, when we're working, pay our income tax through the Treasury. They send money out throughout the country to all of the departments of education. So what you're saying to people is, we now want a third tax. And it's, it's, that's, in anyone's language, mm. that's wholly inappropriate and not acceptable at all. Pam, do you think uh, Keir Starmer should drop this plan? I mean, he would say, look, these aren't really charitable institutions. They're essentially businesses. Now, some of them are not for profit, but essentially someone in most uh, of these institutions is making some sort of profit somewhere. So why shouldn't there be VAT on them? That would be his argument. Well, yeah, but you see, I don't agree with that because when you look at the resources that these children going to the schools have, you know, there's all the extra facilities which we've lost in the comprehensive schools, even sport field basics, because the local authorities sold everything off. Yeah. Well, listen, thank you very much indeed for your points, Pam. They're very well made. Pam is in Northumberland. She gave me a ring on 0344 499 1000. Alicia Fitzgerald is with me all morning. I mean, Pam really sums it up very well there, doesn't she? Absolutely. And I think she very much echoes how lots of people feel about this. I mean, it's not to say that everyone thinks, agrees with private schools. That's yep. the important thing. Lots of people fundamentally disagree with the purpose of them. But that's not to say that this policy would just kind of hit the wrong people yeah. it's hitting the wrong people it's not hitting the people who, who can afford a 20 percent rise on their on their face taxing you know. the middle classes again which is something that the labor party and, and come many under working class people for. who yeah. are taking extra jobs and making those huge sacrifices exactly. alicia is with me uh, until one o'clock um and actually after that as well we're going for lunch in the canteen um so uh, <laughs> come ne- join us <laughs> yeah, indeed. Uh, nina has been uh, it, nina is in rian's park and sent me a whatsapp and she says what is the badge you're wearing it's actually um both alicia and i are wearing this badge as are a lot of our colleagues and what it says on the badge or reads on the badge more accurately is hashtag I stand with Evan and that's because Evan Gershevitz who was a uh, what well is a Wall Street Journal reporter has been detained by Russia for almost exactly a year and uh, we are um, we are we're just remembering him today we're thinking about him who is de- detained by Russia and it's uh, it's um, absolutely appalling that he is uh, detained there he should be released immediately he was doing journalism he wasn't a spy as L- Russia has ludicrously said and he actually worked in this building we, we, we this building News UK has a number of different uh, journalistic institutions in it including the London Bureau of the Wall Street Journal so um, Evan was was a colleague of ours and um, 
still is a colleague of ours and someone we uh, are thinking about a lot. That's why we're wearing the badges today. So that's all about Evan Gershowitz. He was first arrested on the 29th of March 2023 and the anniversary is this Friday. So for the next few days, you'll see us, if you're watching Talk TV, you'll see us wearing these badges. And thanks to Nina for that question. I probably should have pointed it out at the start, actually. Um, DJB has been in touch, says, VAT on private schools, why are Labour not also targeting universities who also have charitable status? Well, listen, we're going to continue talking about this. I'm going to talk to a, uh, a head teacher of a private school a little bit later on this hour, actually. So we'll do that. But first of all, we're going to talk about what Tim Davey has said. Um, this is the Director General of the BBC. And uh, the Conservatives uh, apparently have reeled against what he said ar uh, already because uh, Tim Davey, who is the Director General, has floated the idea of wealthier Britons being made to pay a higher BBC licence fee. So the corporation is looking at licence fee, non-payment and whether criminalisation is actually the best option to enforce compliance. I mean, there's some uh, crazy statistic about our magistrates' courts. I think it's over half um, the cases in magistrates' courts are about people not paying their licence fee. Um, and uh, he's told the Royal Television Society, this is Tim Davey, the Director General of the BBC, there is no doubt that the market has changed hugely since the licence fee was introduced and I think it's right to ask fundamental questions about its longevity. Well, one person who knows all about this, in fact, he's written a brand new book on it. It's called How Do We Pay for the BBC After 2027? He's a former BBC producer. His name is John Mayer. John, you're very welcome to the programme. It was good to see you in person uh, a few weeks ago as well. We bumped into each other at an event. Um, how should we pay for the BBC, do you think? Do you think it's fair to uh, have a sort of sliding scale of a licence fee or should it be a flat fee, John? In Peter, look, this is a tax. This is a regressive tax at the moment. All taxes are progressive, usually, in the modern world. Council taxes, income taxes. What are the Tories going on about? You know, rich people should pay more, poor people less. But I do actually think that Tim rather bottled it yesterday. I was there, and I thought he bottled it. I thought he's, he's wedded to the licence fee. I don't know why. He just wouldn't consider an alternative bit. Advertising, it's out. I mean, if it's advertising, you lot will be out of business on the BBC. But, you know, he should think about some form of a hybrid where... The BBC actually has some form of subscription on the iPlayer to make its money out of its intellectual property. It has a huge intellectual property. It, it's the National TV Archive. Why didn't it use that? Why didn't they have specialist channels? Dad's Army, Sport, things like that. You know, he bottled out of that. He said that he, he called them walled gardens. Well, they're not actually. And I mean, I put it to him personally. I said, look, um, Tim, 23 million people subscribe to Sky and, and 19 million to, to Netflix. And he said, so what? So what? Well, that was his reaction to me. I, I know him quite well, so I took it from him. And you know, he, he and he also said, "Look, hybrid, hybrid. We already we already have hybrids. We have hybrids. You know, we we, we have uh, 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 GB. We have the, T, the other TV stations and so on." He said, and I said, "No, that isn't hybrid. No, he, he they really will have to be more imaginative about about the, about the, the license. They will not make huge amounts of money mm. out, out of." BBC Studios, they only pay 300 million a year to the BBC. So it's, BBC it's, it's probably... It's, it's, it's probably 3.8 million a year. Where are they going to get that money from? The, the, the licence fee cannot really go up much more. I mean, my view is it should actually go down to 100 quid, a basic licence fee, and then you pay for anything else the other side of the iPlayer. So, you know, you make money out of your, pro your intellectual property. And it's, and it's actually own. going up on the 1st of April, John. It's going to rise to £169.50. No, no. So, so, so your your plan would be to charge sort of flat fee of £100 and then you pay maybe a bit extra for the iPlayer uh, if you wanted. You is, that, is that right? You get £100, you, you, get, you get all the services, but you get them once. OK, OK. You want to buy more, you go to the other side of the airplane. What about, I've always thought, I, I thought, I mean, look, when the when the internet was, I would say, when the World Wide Web, I suppose, was starting and newspapers were going on the World Wide Web and so on, I found it weird that there wasn't some sort of idea about almost a kind, you know, like iTunes, you buy one song on iTunes, you don't have to buy the whole album, you don't have to pay a subscription yeah. to iTunes, you just pay sort of 99p or 79p or whatever. I thought with, with uh, an article or perhaps even a television programme, would it not make sense to say, right, we're going to pay 5p an article or even 1p an article? Is there, you know, would, would that sort and of system And why work? not? And if, 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 you, if you're a specialist in Dad's Army or a specialist, if you want to see the proms, you pay a little bit of money to the BBC. 
the other side of the iPlay, make the iPlay a paywall, and actually charge people to go to the other side of that paywall. What about so, the stuff and then that you could actually afford decent sport, decent drama, and everything else? So you know, Tim Tim bottled it a bit, you know. Yeah, they, they John, what about the stuff? I just want to ask you about the stuff that's that's well, less that's, that's less popular, the stuff that only the BBC does. That's very very specialist things, things like. Um, often, well, you know, you know the, the types, children's programming, for example, yeah. news as part of the Ofcom remit and so on, uh, and, and that would be funded through this, you think, in your, in your idea? In it would be funded through, through a licence fee, but, but, you know, things are, which are specialist, which people want, you know, natural history, if you're heavily into natural history, you can watch it once on, on, on the main channel, but if you, if you want a natural history channel, pay some oh. money for it. People will, you know, people, 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 people pay for Netflix, they, you know, he, he was he was going on about Disney. Disney was getting all this money for Doctor Who. Well, you know Disney are in trouble, and Disney are not going to subsidise the BBC forever in a day. Yeah, John, you speak a lot of sense, and uh, we've had a, a much more uh, agreeable chat, I think, than perhaps the last time when we clashed quite uh, quite well, that, that was probably over a glass of wine, Peter. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. That is John Mayer, who is editor of a brand new book, How Do We Pay for the BBC After 2027? That's when the licence fee uh, is coming up again. Well, how do you think we should pay for the BBC, or, or should we not pay for the BBC at all? Because there's a lot of people who don't uh, pay their licence fee, who watch and listen to this station, and that's absolutely fine. Although if you watch live TV, you've got to have a licence fee, um, and that is something that a lot of people have very strong views on. Let me know your thoughts. So three four 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 nine nine one thousand maybe you agree with john and some of the ideas that he has as well thanks to christine and surrey who has uh, texted me on private schools lots of people talking about private schools today um it's my second time around for me because i uh, now look after my nine-year-old granddaughter says christine if my family could afford to we would send her to a private school the state system is failing our children it's just a box ticking exercise my heart bleeds for the children left behind Half of universities could, should be turned back into technical colleges where children, young children could learn a trade, that, or where youngsters, I should say, could learn a trade. This would benefit themselves and the wider society. Very sensible, Christine. Thanks also to Penny in Bedfordshire. He says, good morning, Peter. Excellent show as usual. Thanks, Penny. Regarding labour in private schools, Keir Starmer benefited from attending a selective grammar school, which became a private school while he was there. Very few areas of grammar schools, so what choice do parents have if their child is not getting the educational opportunities you feel they deserve? My husband and I sent our daughter to private school, made sacrifices to do that, adding another 20% to the cost is the politics of envy. He is doing it to appeal to the voters who would support that. Well, Penny, thank you for that. I went to a grammar school, and actually, in Northern Ireland, there are very, very few private schools. I think you count them on the fingers of both hands. There are very few private schools, vast majority are state schools. I had a brilliant grammar school education. I was educated comprehensively for three years of my secondary education, then in a grammar school for four years in a slightly different system, I think, called the Dixon Plan. And uh, I, I really benefited from a grammar school education, but there were kids who went to the local high school, which does a great job now, but at the time wasn't great. So I think there, there are all sorts of systems. And also in England, what often happens in areas like Buckinghamshire, I have a friend who uh, lives, uh, lived originally in Amersham in Buckinghamshire, went to a very good local grammar school there. Well, the house prices are even higher because you don't have to pay school fees. So it comes out in different ways. Lots of debate about this, including from Cam in Northampton, who's given me a ring on 0344. 499-1000. Cam, you're very welcome to the programme. What would you like to say? Hi, uh, um, so yeah, just give you a quick background. I grew up on a council estate, um, worked my backside off to, you know, give a better life to my kids. Around 10, 15 years ago, the school system here was, was pretty good. There were new schools being built. You know, there was a positiveness about the place. We moved into an area specifically for a state school education for my children. My daughter went to state school for the first primary phase, but education standards went down, funding went down, and I then we then took the decision for to send our daughter to a private school. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the point that Kia Starmer is missing is that there is a whole swathe of parents across this land who would happily support the state school system and not have their children in in private schools they're doing it because they see issues in the state system yeah. so my daughter the best thing we ever did was send to that private school. we struggled for years and years to send her there just give me a sense if you don't mind cam you, you've been brilliant and you've been really honest and straightforward in this can you just give people a sense of how much you were paying because i just want to make the point that we're not Absolutely. talking about people paying 50 grand a year we're talking about people paying a lot less money Absolutely, and I was going to come to that. So people stretch, and we were paying between fifteen and twenty thousand pounds a year. I mean, that's a lot of money. 
it, it is a lot of money. My point is that what Keir Starmer's forgetting is that if he adds that VAT on top of those 15 to 20 grand fees, that will push that too far out of reach mm -hmm. for parents like myself. And what ends up happening? Those parents put their children extra strain back on the state school system. And it's, it, and it's yet more strain on the broken system. P people are putting their children into these private schools that are not like Winchester or you know Eton or yeah. these kind of places because they can see the problems in the state system. They're not doing it because they think all private schools are better than all state schools. Mm -hmm. it, our state school was amazing. If I could show you it, you wouldn't believe how... It's like a new university campus in green space. But the standards went down shockingly badly, so that's why we did it. And you it. cannot and blame you, people. You cannot ever blame people to because, who want the best for their kids. You know, I would never judge anyone in terms of where they sent their kid to school. It's a, it's a completely ridiculous thing, and it's a very personal choice. So tell me about how you funded that and what kind of sacrifices you made, Cam. So I had to take extra work on. I had to work abroad, away from my family. We also have two children who happen to be autistic. So we moved into this place thinking white picket fence life. You know, we'll, all the kids will walk down to the bottom of the street to where the school is and it'll be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, they all ended up going to different schools. And mm -hmm. we had the same issues with the uh, special needs schools locally that we did with the state school. It's interesting it, as well because when you, yeah. when you have kids with special educational needs who are in private schools, obviously there's provision there and that's within the fees. But if they go into a state school, they have a legal right, of course, to get that uh, extra help. And that's going to be another strain on the... Uh, and some people put their kids into private schools because they want that extra help. They want that sort of one-to-one -one support and so on and, and make that sacrifice when kids have special educational needs. So we're not talking about toffee-nosed people who have loads and loads of money. Absolutely. And when we took one of our sons to the local school, the funding had been cut so drastically that the special educational needs lead at that school said, I said, look, please be honest with me. Can you support our son? She said, she closed the door and she said, to be honest, I'm not getting the support here. Funding's been cut left, right and centre. You know, it's best for your son if he doesn't go here. Wow. I appreciated her honesty, of course. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. But Goodness me. You know, it's one of those things where you're stuck between a rock and a hard place, and Keir Starmer needs to sort out mm. the state school system. Yes. And, you know, and not penalise parents like myself, of which there are swathes, I guarantee, you, hundreds or if not thousands of parents across the country who want to put their kids in state school, but things have gone so bad that they're, you know, going private, and that's helping the state schools, mm. you know, with their lower yeah, yeah. yeah. Cam, yeah. fascinating call. Thank you very, very much indeed. All the best to you and your family. That's Cam in Northampton. Uh, Terence has been in touch on WhatsApp and says, what happens if tens of thousands of pupils have to leave their private schools because of the VAT and flood the state system? Could the state schools cope? Has Starmer et al. taken this possibility into account? It's a big issue. Uh, Alicia Fitzgerald is still with me. Um, it's, I mean, and Cam was talking there about a very ordinary, very normal family who made sacrifices, I mean, 15 to 20 grand, huge amount of money, especially after tax, and all the sacrifices they made. Lots of people getting in touch saying the same thing. And I, I wonder whether this is actually going to be more of an electoral issue for Keir Starmer than he thinks it might be. Well, I was just going to say, bring it back to the more politics side of all of this. I mean, Labour have been doing a lot of grappling with how to fund their promises because they don't want to fall into the trap of being called the party that makes unfunded promises um, and just has really high taxes to pay for absolutely everything that, that, that they're promising to do. So their two main things that they've been pushing is abolishing the non-dom tax status, which was slightly scuppered at the recent budget because Jeremy Hunt has now said that he'll do the same and kind of beat them to it. Yes. Um, and the second thing was putting this VAT on private schools, and both of which faced a lot of criticism in that they don't generate enough money to do all of the big things that Labour have promised. But the thing is, if they take this away, then what are they going to do instead? Well, on so that they... point as well, on, on the on the money, and again, this uh, head teacher I was talking to at the weekend, fascinating woman actually, tried to get her on, but she, she couldn't do it. Um, so we're talking to, to one of her friends. But <laughs> Labour is saying... Where you know they will raise 1.9 billion pounds through this uh, taxation, mm. but the fact is that that is predicated on one. That is predicated on every child staying within 
the uh, private school system. That's just not going to happen. Well, well, definitely not if they put this policy in place. As all, pretty much all of the callers and all of the texters to this show have said so far, it's the people who have worked extra hard yep. or made sacrifices in order to make this just about possible. Mm -hmm. And a possible. <laughs> possible? <laughs> it's that time of day. Maybe should have gone to private school. They would have taught you, taught, taught you how to speak. <laughs> Maybe. It's that added <laughs> perk. Um, yeah, it's those people who have sacrificed things already just to make this already high amount possible who then probably won't be able to make it work if that extra amount is added. And that will just send a lot of people naturally into the state system. So th there doesn't really seem to be any kind of work being done to make sure that that doesn't happen. Yeah. So there's a lot of flaws with this, for sure. Uh, Bex has been in touch on WhatsApp. She says, hi, Peter, regarding the private schools, a lot of these parents who pay for the kids to go to private uh, schools are complaining about the fact that they also pay for state schools through taxes. They seem to be ignorant of the reality that people who don't have or want kids are also paying for state schools. Well, that is, that, that's a very, very fair point, actually in terms of the fact that, well, there are lots of people who pay for lots of different things that, you know, I'm, I am I think having uh, Trident as a nuclear deterrent is a complete waste of money. And we've seen recently that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, I mean, I want the country to be defended, don't get me wrong. And if there's a nuclear war, you know, we, we should have nuclear warheads. But, I mean, it's, it's nonetheless a complete waste of money. It doesn't work. Um, but my taxes pay for that, you know, and my taxes, I don't have children, but my taxes pay for the education system. I mean, that, that's the nature of taxation, I'm afraid. Uh, I've got a lot out of the taxation system. Uh, I suppose I've had uh, various various good things from the state. Um, Darren is in Belfast. Now, and this is, Darren is somewhere where uh, you understand the, uh, the pros, the uh, good points about grammar schools in Northern Ireland, Darren, and I know you're a fan of them. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to basically come on and sort of say that Maybe it's our system that basically needs to be looked at because obviously it has slightly changed. Um, we're taking it away and natural selection is something that happens through life. But I think from my point of view is, is that it allowed those upper working class, middle class families to be able to access the quality education, whereas the Belfast Royal Academy, the Inst, Methody, whatever it may be. Did you go to grammar school, Darren? Um, um, I did. Um, I went to basically um, BRA, and uh, literally airline. Uh, Belfast Royal to... Academy, and it, it's a it's yeah. a very very good school. But I suppose the the, the slight flaw. Or, or well, it's some of the people who say it's a big flaw is for people who don't get into grammar schools and selecting kids at eleven is something that a lot of people feel isn't isn't it's too much pressure at that age. Look, life is natural selection. Every child's an individual. They go at different levels, and sometimes, basically, you know, girls are ahead of boys, and vice versa. But for me, it's an option. And yeah. if you want to be able to do it, there was people that I knew that I went to primary school who didn't take it, were capable of doing it, but didn't want to do it. Yeah. Um, and therefore, basically, that's a choice. But the problem with it is, I come, I go backwards and forwards from, you know, Belfast to basically Cambridge all the time, and. Literally, the problem with it is if you can afford to own a nice house, live in a nice area, then you will more likely get a good school. If yeah. you can't afford to basically have a nice house in a nice area, then you're likely to not have less likelihood to have like a great outcome. Yeah. So that's the disparity between England. But unfortunately, there isn't those safety nets and disparities and I would say social difficulty outcome yeah. is wider. So obviously, being able to afford to get the housing ladder is smaller where we come from. But I think it needs to be looked at a role model situation whereby is the only need. When people talk about private schools, they think of millionaires. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's, it's just it's just not the case. And Darren, you make some really really case. good points there. And I, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of the Northern Ireland grammar schools. I went to one, and I probably wouldn't be sitting here if I hadn't. Uh, Graham has been in touch. He says, "Well, we put uh, both our children through private schools. It was a real struggle. There were many in the same position at their schools. If 20% VAT was added on at the time, then that would have pushed us over the limit, and they would not have gone to, and they would have gone, I should say, they would have gone to a state school and would not have gone on to be to decent universities to become doctors." Says Graham. Leslie says, uh, what is Starmer going to do with this extra 20% tax he's going to take from these fee-paying parents? Well, it's going to pay for all the spending plans. We're going to talk, about, talk to Alicia about that a bit more a bit later in the programme. She's the political correspondent of this station and with me right through until one o'clock. We're going to talk next about Scotland because they have got controversial new hate crime laws. They're coming into law at the start of April, so just over a week's time. J.K. Rowling, the Harry Potter author, has dubbed it the mother of all April Fool's jokes amid fears the legislation could be used to prosecute comedians and women's rights campaigners. We've got the lowdown on that next here on Talk TV.
A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. We've been talking about private schools for a lot of this morning and I want to make sure that Labour uh, has a red reply to this. Now Labour has its plan 20% uh, uh, VAT on private school fees and it's commented recently, Labour Party has commented recently, it says Labour will invest in delivering a brilliant state education for all our children funded by ending tax breaks for private schools. Independent schools do not have a pass uh, do not have to pass this change on to parents. Independent schools do not have to pass on pass this on to parents, this change in this money. Well, we'll get into that in a minute or two. We'll be talking to the head of a uh, state school and um, I'm actually going to ask that particular aspect because I think it's, it's well, we'll see how realistic it is anyway. Thanks to everybody who's been in touch. We're asking the question today. Labour's plan to impose taxes on private schools has been criticised. Is Sir Keir Starmer going to be taxing aspiration when he almost certainly becomes the next Prime Minister of this country? Mark says, if posh school fees can be afforded, then so can pay more taxes. Um, Martin says, the people who've sent their children to private school have paid for the places as a state school anyway through taxation. What is the thinking behind this policy? I think I've read that out before, actually. Sorry. Um, I've been given... Uh, a piece of, uh, piece of paper that I've read out before. Uh, apologies for that. Michael says he is not planning to impose taxes on public schools, but rather remove their unjust VAT exemption. Why is this even an issue? Ah, yes, rich people losing an unjust tax break. Well, Michael, I think, I think of, as we've heard on uh, from many people, listen, this isn't always rich people. This is people, yeah, they, they, they have the money to give uh, their kids a private school education, but often they have made huge sacrifices in order to do so. Um, Steve says... 
If parents can't afford it, send the children to state schools and donate the fees to get the rack problem fixed. Al says this doesn't impact the super wealthy. It hurts those that struggle to give their kids the best opportunities. Those with money can afford increases. It's once again the middle and aspiring classes that get opportunities taken away. Sam says having rich parents equals aspiration. Neil says so they want you to pay money to the, to the government for not using the government's money in the first place. Uh, Paul says squeezing the middle harder. Lots and lots of comments on this. Lots of people getting in touch and we will talk to the head of of a private school in just a few minutes. But first I want to talk about an equally important uh, story because free speech has been a huge issue this week. We've seen Dame Sarah Khan's report. I interviewed her a couple of days ago. 76% of people saying that they have self-censored, they haven't said certain things in their homes and workplaces in any sort of public situation. They're worried about being cancelled. Well, there's now a piece of legislation that's due to come into uh, place in Scotland. The Hate and Public Order Scotland Act uh, that comes into force on the 1st of April, so Monday week, criminalising threatening, it criminalises threatening or abusive behaviour which is intended to, to stir up hatred based on certain characteristics including age, disability, sexual orientation and, big shock, transgender identity. Well, let's talk to Susan Smith, she's Director of Four Women Scotland. Susan, you're very welcome to the programme. Uh, what do you make of this legislation, Susan? Thank you. Well, the problem, the immediate problem is not so much the legislation, although there are many, many issues with the legislation, but the fact that the um, police service, what we can discern so far from the training the police have been given, is that it it's highly, it's highly biased and it doesn't even reflect the law, which is bad enough to start with. And um, it's been deemed not fit for purpose by both the past and the current chair of the police federation in scotland so, so what are police officers who will of course have to slightly interpret but also enforce this law what have what have they actually been told in scotland and by police scotland or at least those who are training them and police scotland presumably spending uh, money on uh, on training to to give to these officers well um according to according to the current uh, chair of police federation they've been given a sort of online um two-hour um, training package that um, often doesn't actually represent the law. So it has the incidence of a high profile politician being called an, a rude name on the street. And this is actually a direct reference to something that happened to Patrick Harvey, who's one of the um, keenest proponents on um, He's, he's a Green Party politician, Green. isn't he? MSP, I think, uh, rather than an MP? Yeah. Uh, that's right. He's an MSP and he's the leader of the Scottish Greens. He's also a minister um, in the Scottish government. And he was one of the people who was... But very, they, they very might argue, look, this is a real world example. This is something that actually happened and this is how the law is changing and this is what you should do about it. Surely that's a reasonable example, is it not? Um, well, it's not because it doesn't really meet the threshold for a crime. Well, it doesn't meet the threshold for a crime and it doesn't meet the threshold I would consider for stirring up. But this is the problem that we've got this very grey area where the police aren't sure. And it's this stirring up part of the bill that's been problematic. So um, we've had hate crime for a while in Scotland and covering these protected characteristics, but it's an aggravator. So if you commit a crime and it's motivated by hate, by racism um, or by homophobia, for example, you get a harsher sentence. But what this new um, Act is saying is that if you distribute material that people think is harmful or if you say things that people think are upsetting, you can also be prosecuted for this very vague crime of stirring up hatred. But, but no one has the right not to be offended, but it seems that maybe they do now with this change. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, you know, I mean, the, I, I could the... say your scarf offends me. Does that mean I? Does that mean you get arrested? By the way, it's a lovely <laughs> scarf. <laughs> well, no, because I'm only a lowly woman, and one of the things about hate crime legislation is they establish hierarchies about who is protected, who the government considers worthy, and who they don't consider worthy. So you can run around saying all sorts of nasty things about women and um, that won't meet any threshold for any crime. So, so if you, if you make really issue. sexist remarks, if I if I uh, said something terrible about, you know, all women and belong in the kitchen or something like that, yeah. that, that would not be considered as part of this. But if I say, you know, trans women are actually men, that would be something that would perhaps would be considered as part of it. 
Yes, and they will say that, no, you won't be done for saying trans women are men, but we know people are reporting people already for comments like that. Um, only yesterday, or, or Monday rather, we found out that another MSP had been reported to the police for saying that a non-binary identity was as valid as claiming to be a cat. And um, he, I mean, in, in, non- in fairness, there'll be lots of people who will report all sorts of things, but the police may not necessarily do something about it. But you're right, there is definite confusion here and, and a real nervousness about this, what this law is actually going to mean. That's right. And um, especially because the police have said they're going to investigate all of these complaints. So even if they investigate them and find there's nothing, nothing uh, criminal has occurred, they might still log, for example, a non-crime hate incident. And that can come up in an advanced um, uh, disclosure check. So if you're wanting to work with children or vulnerable adults, you might be told you can't do that work because the police have got a file on you based on all these um, spurious and malicious complaints. Listen, thank you very, very much indeed. Um, We'll keep a very close eye on this and we'll continue talking to Susan Smith there. She's Director for Women's Scotland. And thank you to lots of people who have been in touch. Simon in Aberdeen says, another half-baked, I thought, rubbish law from the SNP and Greens. Terry in Ramsbottom says, just because you're offended doesn't mean you're right. Uh, You're absolutely correct, Terry. Um, And David McKay, or McKay, I'm not sure, says, um, this bill is overwhelmingly not supported by the actual people in Scotland being pushed through by one of the most divisive and hated politicians I've ever seen in 40 Five years of living in Scotland. SNP out, says David McKay, referring, I think, to Humza Youssef, who is the First Minister of Scotland. We have some breaking news now on Talk TV, and that is that record numbers of migrants crossed the channel in the first three months of 2024. That The total number, 4,000. 644 approximately migrants have crossed the English Channel to the UK so far in 2024. A record for the first three months of a calendar year. That is a provisional Home Office figures showing that. Alicia Fitzgerald is the political correspondent of Talk TV. Not exactly going very well with stopping the boats if 4,644 migrants have crossed the English Channel so far in 2024, Alicia. Definitely not. And I think the other thing that I thought when that breaking news cropped up was that it's not much of a shock. And that's also Mm. not a good thing either for the government or for for the country. I mean, Rishi Sunak has really chosen illegal migration as his absolute hill to die on with his premiership. Exactly the phrase that Paul Scully, (laughs) the Conservative MP, used earlier when I interviewed him. That's exactly what he's done. And, And more specifically, the Rwanda policy, not just illegal migration, but the Rwanda policy, he is saying, is going to be the be-all and end-all to stop illegal migration, to stop these small boat crossings. And I'll even remember just a few months ago when the amount of small boat crossings actually decreased, lots of front bench cabinet ministers were saying it was because of the Rwanda policy, which hasn't actually been successful so far. But they and were, they were arguing it was a deterrent it. even before it came in. But, I mean, it, it just there's just no evidence to support that, I would there's argue. None. Yeah, okay. uh, there's no evidence to support that, and I mean, t- t- clearly these figures show that it's definitely not working, and, and that they need to do something else if they want voters to actually believe that they are going to stop this problem because it, it's not it's not working. I mean, record numbers of migrants crossing the migrant uh, record number of migrants crossing the channel in the first three months of 2024. 4,644 migrants crossing the channel into the UK so far in 2024. Is this the nail in the coffin for the Tories, do you think? I mean, I think the nail in the coffin happened quite uh, some time ago, if I'm being totally Just honest. Extra nails. Um, yes, it's an extra nail for sure, and it's an extra nail probably from the same hammer, if you'd like to if you'd like to say that, because this has been an issue that's just got worse and worse and worse for the Conservative Party. The other issue is, is what happens when they arrive here? We've got the Bibby Stockholm barge in Dorset, that's in the Dorset coast, which is already quite controversial um, as a government measure as it is. And then we've got asylum seekers in hotels across the UK, and that's, again, something that lots of the UK public take issue with. So... Whilst we have Rishi Sunak, that was him in his New Year video in January mm. saying, oh, we've cleared the asylum backlog and it turned out to be... Spoiler alert, you haven't. The legacy backlog, not the actual backlog, yeah, yeah. because that's apparently how you could categorise things. You say potato, just... I say potato. Exactly. Yeah. So we, we, we haven't done that. And the interesting thing as well with the plan to take those uh, would-be migrants out of hotels and put them in places like RAF bases, that's actually going to cost, going to cost more than keeping them in hotels. It's, it's mad. Let me know your reaction to this. 0344 499 1000. Thank you to people getting in touch on all the stories we're talking about this morning, including private schools. Uh, one person says the police in Scotland uh, on the issue of the hate crime law we've just been talking about a second ago. The police in Scotland are no longer police but are social wardens. Graham says when we uh, put both our children through private schools, it was a real struggle. 
there were many in the same position at their schools. If 20% VAT was added on at the time, then that would have pushed us over the limit and they would have gone to state school not gone on uh, to, do, uh, to, to, to uh, do great jobs. David says, if the middle class are pushed out of private schooling, not only will this increase the pressure on state schools, but the parents will no longer work all hours God sends to meet the fees. So we'll pay less tax accordingly. Really good point, David. Haven't thought about that. As ever, no joined up thinking, just nasty socialism seeking to hurt anyone with aspirations. Sean's been in touch as well. Uh, while I don't like the divisions and privileges that those with wealth get to go to these schools, we have to remember that some do offer the chance for those who have from poorer backgrounds to be able to get to them. There are scholarships, no doubt about that. Do we wish to take that away from very bright kids who, because of the lack of wealthy parents, would ever get the chance to go to these schools because of tax being withdrawn? Well, we're going to talk to the head teacher of a private school who thinks she is at risk and her school is at risk because of this proposed change by Keir Starmer. Stay with us here on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just for, minutes, for, Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. Well, Labour have already been reacting to that breaking news in regard to people crossing the channel. Stephen Kinnock is the Shadow Immigration Minister. He's responding to news that 338 people crossed the channel on Tuesday, yesterday, making a total of 1,115 in the last seven days, the busiest week yet for arrivals and the busiest start to a year on record, almost a quarter higher than the same point in 2023. Well, Stephen Kinnock, who's the Shadow Immigration Minister, said, despite all the evidence to the contrary, Rishi Sunak keeps on telling the British people that small boat arrivals are coming down and has promised to stop the boats remains on track. Can he not see what is happening from inside his number 10 bunker, or does he think that we can't see it for ourselves? 
Either way, it's time to get a grip and restore order to the border. Labour, uh, Stephen Kinnock says, will strengthen our border security, crush the smuggling gangs, clear the asylum backlog, end hotel use and set up a new returns and enforcement unit so those with no right to be in the UK are swiftly returned. That is the plan we need, according to Stephen Kinnock, who is Labour's Shadow Immigration Minister, reacting to those record figures of migrants crossing the channel, biggest of the first three months of the year. Uh, we'll continue to uh, talk about that story, of course, but that is Labour's reaction to the breaking news. Um, lots more people getting in touch about private schools as well, and indeed the uh, story we're talking about on hate crime. Anne has been in touch to say, uh, we all rubbed along just fine before this, all this hate crime nonsense. Aren't there more pressing issues to deal with, says Anne. Um, on the uh, question we're asking you today, which is Labour's plan to impose taxes on private schools, that's been criticised, the idea of 20% VAT on private school fees. Is Keir Starmer taxing aspiration? James has been in touch. He says the Tories already currently tax aspiration. So is it him taxing that specifically? No. And in this instance, frankly, people should be more invested in improving public schooling, which everyone who works for... Uh, pays for. Is he carrying on what the Tories were doing? Probably. Nessa says Starmer is clueless. He's another Boris. Say one thing to get the job, do the opposite. Can't be trusted. And finally, Simon says, I am putting both my children through a good small private school to give them the best chance at being economically productive in life. It's an aspiration I could not achieve myself because I'm the product of a single parent family where private education was completely beyond my mum's resources. It's mostly people like me who this idiotic, spiteful, ideologically driven and greedy policy will hit, not the billionaire family families sending their kids to Eton. Well, let's hear from the front line. Claire Robinson is head teacher at Home Grange. Claire, uh, thank you for joining me. I hope you're enjoying your Easter holidays. Uh, we're, uh, we're talking about this uh, levy. I know you have about 700 pupils, Claire. Your fees range from £2,205 to uh, £5,935 return. I think we're having a problem with, with uh, sound just with Claire at the moment. We'll get her audio back, uh, no doubt. But, I mean, this is... Uh, Lissy Fitzgerald is still with me here. This is a very, very big issue. Labour have said that they will invest in delivering a brilliant state education for all our children funded by ending tax breaks for private schools. Lissy, sorry, I'll come back to you in a second. We have... <laughs> apologies, false alarm. We have Claire back, Claire Robinson, head teacher at Home Grange. Um, Claire, thank you for joining us. Um, tell us a bit about your school. Okay, hi. Yeah, we're through school, so we take students from um, nursery up to 16. Uh, we're boys and girls, non-selective, and have children of, of, of all abilities in the school. Um, so um, how, I, you, people are paying between about £2,200 and £5,900 a term. To a lot of people, that's a heck of a lot of money, but we're not talking about Eton and Harrow and places like that. We're not talking about 50 grand a year. What are the kind of parents who send their kids to your school just paint a picture of the kind of sacrifices sometimes people make to afford those fees yeah thank you uh, our parents are everyday parents most of the parents are two working parents that are working hard and make sacrifices because they want to have the choice uh, to choose where they send their child to school and um, so they have actively made the choice to, to go to independent schools uh, and are making some are making many sacrifices to do so um, it's interesting because with this plan, 20% VAT uh, on uh, school fees, what, what effect would that have on your school? I think it would affect some of our parents. Um, fortunately, we are, uh, we're, we're financially sound, but I think it does concern me, this independent sector as a whole. Um, some of our parents may well have to consider whether they continue uh, to fund uh, independent education because 20% on a fee, um, or, you know, if they're paying 5,900 at the top of the school and have 20% on that, uh, that's a considerable hike in fees. Uh, and so that may be something that they may have to reconsider whether they won't wish to invest right the way through the school um, for their child. Labour have said independent schools do not have to pass this change on to parents. What do you make of that? Yeah, I would say that's quite right. But if independent schools could afford um, to run with their fees at 20% uh, lower than they are at the moment, um, then they would be doing so. Uh, all the money that the fees that come in to most independent schools, in schools like ourselves, every penny gets reinvested back into the school for the pupils. Um, and fee income is our only income. Um, so we couldn't necessarily, like many schools, um, 
just have a 20% lower fee um, because we would have been doing so for many years uh, had we had we been able to. Is this a tax on aspiration, do you think? I think it's a tax on aspiration. I think it's a tax on choice. Um, and I think it's potentially ill thought out. Um, I'm not confident that the figures add up and I'm not confident that the figures that they uh, have claimed for many years would, would ha have an impact on state education and, and fund state education will actually come to fruition. And on that, on um, that point of potentially... the... Sorry to interrupt you, uh, Claire, but on that, on that point of the fees and the extra money, Labour say it would raise one9 billion pounds but actually if you have people taking their children out of the state school system that doesn't quite work does it no it doesn't uh, and in fact there has been an independent body that's looked at um, the figures and would dispute the figures that the labor party are putting out uh, regarding the income that would come as a result of adding vat on fees um, I, I want to ask you about the fact that only 6.4% of pupils in England, those are the figures from 2021, actually go to private school. I mean, some people might say, why, why do we care about wealthy people being taxed more? They're not all wealthy people. That's that's the point, I think. Uh, many of the parents aren't wealthy people. They have just made a choice that they would like um, to educate their children within the system that offers them something that perhaps they're not able to get or that they don't want um, in the state sector. Uh, I've been ahead in both sectors, so I understand how both sectors work and I understand the strains um, in the state sector. And if you have a large increase of pupils back into that state sector, um, it potentially could put an increasing um, demand on them as well. In terms of the people who are, uh, you say they're not, they're not wealthy. Just what are the kind of are people having extra jobs? Are they taking extra extra work on and so on? Just tell us about some of your parents. Um, we have a very widespread of uh, parent body, and I would say that the parent body, as I, as I mentioned, basically make, make sacrifices that most of my parents are two working parents. Um, so both of the parents are working um, and they require cover uh, for their children throughout the holidays as well um, to enable them to do so and to enable them to work to be able to continue with those fees that they're paying for, the, for their children to come to the school. Um, so it, it is it perhaps sacrifices in other areas of their life that they may not, some of those parents, not all of them, um, but some of them would be making uh, to make that choice for their child to come to school. You've worked both in the state sector and in the independent sector. What are the benefits, do you think, of working in a private school? What, what's the difference? What, what's the, the value add that people get if they uh, do make the sacrifice and send their kids to a, a private school? I think it's opportunity. Uh, I think that the, uh, the the nature that we are independent is that we can have our own curriculum. Um, we're driven, um, our school in particular, and I think many independent schools uh, have their unique uh, element of what is unique. Um, we're driven by our ethos. Uh, and I think that the opportunities that we provide our young people, uh, they have a very, they have a long school day, uh, but it's a very busy busy school day, uh, no one area of the curriculum is less important than another. So it allows every single child to engage in every area of the curriculum from a very, very early age and develop whatever may be their key strengths. Uh, and as, as we can find out what that might be, uh, enable them to thrive. Claire, thank you very much indeed. Claire Robinson, their head teacher of Home Grange School, appreciate that. And uh, Labour has said on this that they will invest in delivering a brilliant state education for all our children funded by ending tax breaks for private schools. Independent schools do not have to pass on this change to parents. But as Claire said, if they could, uh, you know, they're not making many of them 20% profit. And if they could have lower fees, well, well, that's what they would do. Rudy in Bristol has been in touch. He says the VAT on schools would give an advantage for kids attending from abroad as they would be able to be exempt from VAT and it was a big class as an export giving our own kids a disadvantage. Leslie says those against parents spending their own money on private education, are they also jealous of others who can afford a better car, house or holidays? Envy is not a pretty trait. Um, this is clearly a very, very big, big issue, as are the boats. And uh, someone was in touch a minute ago saying, I'm confident that the day Labour wins the election, the migrant boats will stop coming. That was dawn on text. Um, how confident are you that that will be the case, Alicia Fitzgerald? Uh, honest answer, not yeah. confident whatsoever. Yeah. In fact, I think quite the opposite, but I'm being totally honest in that breath as well. I don't think that either party at the moment have a solution to the small boats crisis. We've very clearly seen that the Conservative Party don't have a solution to the small boats crisis because 
They keep saying that this Rwanda policy is going to be the thing that does it all, but we've had no evidence of, of it even being slightly successful. I mean, we've not had a single migrant actually go to Rwanda. And yes, lots of people listening to this, I'm sure, will say it's because of the, the foreign courts, it's because of the Supreme Court ruling and all of these, you know, um, bodies that are restricting what the Home Office can and can't do. But even if those weren't there, when you look at the scale and the costs of the Rwanda policy and just how many migrants would actually go, it doesn't seem like it's going to be the silver bullet for it. Alessia, thank you. Alessia Fitzgerald is uh, Talk TV's political correspondent. She's with me right through until one o'clock. We're going to talk in the next hour about the Russian security services accusing Britain, the USA and Ukraine of being behind the deadly terror attack on the Moscow theatre. Well, ISIS actually took responsibility for that. So we'll see uh, what happened. 133 people have been killed in the massacre. We're talking to the doyen of foreign affairs journalism, Mary Dijewski, in just a minute. Stay with us here on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> <laughs> Yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Cross Talk. One o'clock every weekday.
Very good afternoon. This is Talk TV. I'm Peter Cardwell. An absolute pleasure to have your company between now and one o'clock when Alex and Kev take over with Cross Talk. Thank you for your company. We're talking today about all sorts of things, including Russian security services accusing Britain, the USA and Ukraine of being behind the deadly terror attack at the Moscow Theatre a few days ago. 133 people at least have been killed in that massacre for which the terror group Islamic State have, uh, or a division of them anyway, have claimed responsibility. Only one in four people think the NHS is actually working. Public confidence is at its lowest level since records began. That's the front page in the Times today. The public's biggest source of frustration is, unsurprisingly, trying to get a GP's appointment. And is Alicia Fitzgerald a tool of Western imperialism? Or is Alan Titchmarsh, or perhaps both of them? Why were the veteran broadcasters' trousers censored on North Korean TV? That's Alan Titchmarsh rather than uh, Alicia Fitzgerald. We'll be talking to her <laughs> about that. She's with me throughout the hour. Thank you for your company, Alicia. I thought you were just going to say, is Alicia Fitzgerald a tool at first? You didn't finish the sentence. Keep it clean. I was about to say, Peter, Keep so it clean. mean. Come on. Uh, let's have your thoughts on all of these matters. 0344 499 1000 is the number to call. Take as many calls as I can between now and uh, 1 o'clock tomorrow. In Scunthorpe, I'm going to chat to her in just a second about private schools, very, very big issue we're talking about today. 0344 499 1000 is the number for WhatsApp, for WhatsApp voice messages and also for phone calls. You can also text me at 7222 with the word talk in your text. You can tweet me at Talk TV or follow me at Peter Cardwell. Let's spend the next hour together here on Talk TV. Well, on private schools, loads of people getting in touch in all those different ways I just mentioned. Lauren says, I'm putting both my children through a good small private school to give them the best chance of being economically productive in life. It's an aspiration I could not achieve myself because I was a product of a single parent family. James says, Starmer is going to put a tax on everything and follow on with Tory policies. He isn't just going to put a tax on aspiration, but also the rewards of hard work. We're all taxed way too high already. I keep telling everyone Labour will just tax more and more. Simple. Linda says, this will extent independent special schools as well apparently all private schools will exploit a tax loophole let's look at improving the state system and leave private schools alone claire says if they're private businesses for profit they should be taxed like any other donna says private school is a luxury of course it should be taxed uh, graham who i think perhaps has his tongue in his cheek perhaps being a little bit sarcastic says so they want you to pay money to the government for not using the government's money in the first place that's a genius idea here uh, jennifer says while i do not like the divisions and privileges of those who because of wealth get to these schools we have to remember that some do offer the chance of those from poorer backgrounds to be able to go to them do we wish to take that all away from very bright kids on scholarships because of the lack of wealthy parents who would never get that chance at these schools because of being taxed withdrew that well thank you to everybody who's been in touch it's a massive issue today we really have talked about it a lot we're going to talk about russia in a second but before that i want to talk to samantha in sconthorpe and um, thank you for the call on 0344 499 1000 what do you make of the private schools controversy samantha yeah, yeah, morning, Peter. Thanks morning. for taking the call. Um, yeah, well, I mean, looking at it from a, an, in, in another way as well, I mean, it's not been mentioned today, but regarding, you know, the charitable state has been taken away and, and the, the fees increasing, you know, I've heard Labour and other people in the past talk about, oh, well, you know, that surely that's a good thing. These more perhaps capable kids academically will go into the state school system and help to lift it you know yes. well i went to a comp it was very bog standard and uh, you know i can clearly remember it only took one child in the class to misbehave and it didn't matter how bright any of the other ones were you know you could forget it so y y you know it doesn't necessarily work like that either i just wanted to make that point really. I, I think that's a really good point samantha and actually uh, there are lots of people who think, you know, comprehensive schools are the be-all and end-all. I went to a comprehensive school for three years, and I can honestly mm -hmm. say, going to a grammar school, I was I was pretty academic at school, and that just that yeah. just made me more academic as a result. It made me do better because I wasn't challenged by people Absolutely. who just frankly didn't well, want to be there. You, 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 well, you, you're surrounded by kids, you know, and par parental expectations are different. My my son, I didn't, but my son went to a grammar school. We were lucky, and yeah, you know, I mean, he learned. There were there were certain expectations and 
you know, he had a good education. But I don't think, you know, that argument of, oh, well, that'll be good, you know, putting them into the state school system, that'll yeah. lift things. I, I, think it's a really good, I think it's a really good point, Samantha. There, I'm sure there will be people who would perhaps argue against it, but you, may, you make a really, really good point. Graham has been in touch and says there are around 620,000 children in private schools. If 10% are moved out because of increased costs, where is the state going to accommodate these additional 62,000 children in schools that are already oversubscribed, says Graham. Uh, Fiona has been in touch and said, we sent our son to prep school in Northern Ireland. To do this, we had to go forego holidays and other luxury items. We budgeted to ensure he had this opportunity. Both my husband and myself worked full time, therefore paid our taxes. Why do people criticise when you want to do the best for your child? By doing this, it was not lessening the competition for the uh, position in a state school, says Fiona. Well, listen, we'll continue to talk about this. Thanks to everybody who's been in touch. The number 0344 499 1000. But what I want to talk about now is the fact that Russia has now started to blame the West and Kyiv and Ukraine for a jihadist massacre. Mary Dajewski is the doyen on these topics, especially when it comes to Eastern Europe and Russia, and joins me now. She's a foreign affairs uh, columnist at The Independent. Mary, thanks for your company today. Um, it's interesting, we spoke a few days about this, and we heard that uh, Vladimir Putin was, was certainly hinting towards Ukraine in this, but Islamic State has, or a division of Islamic State, has claimed responsibility for these attacks. Why is it now the top Russian officials have directly accused Ukraine and the West of being involved? Is there any evidence to back that up? Well, I think that they've, in a way, they've been looking for a reason to accuse Ukraine, at least, of um, complicity um, in the attack on the Moscow theatre. Um, because, you know, that's the enemy of the moment. Um, and it makes sense to Russians in a way that uh, Islamic State claims maybe maybe don't. Now, the evidence that Russia says they have, or at least the, is really circumstantial. They say um, that the, and, and this was in Putin's very first um, video address on the atrocity. He said that the four people that they've captured for being the culprits were apprehended on the road to Ukraine, where they were hoping to escape to. And not only that, but that um, they'd got as it, what was called a window um, that would allow them to cross the border, which is um, quite heavily fortified and quite dangerous in some places. Um, so that, in a way, was um, their um, indications, really not much more than that, of a Ukrainian connection. Now, yes. against that, this has obviously been the Islamic State claim, mm -hmm. which um, Putin says said on his second television broadcast um, that he basically accepted. And there was also, um, subsequent yesterday, I think, there was a report that actually the the four who were detained were not actually on the on, on the road to Ukraine. They were on the way to Belarus, and that was supposedly confirmed by the president of Belarus. So it's all very, very confusing. I mean, it's interesting you talk about Putin accepting the fact we often or people often think of uh, of Russia as a really straightforwardly hierarchical society. But I wonder if these top Russian officials are directly accusing Ukraine and the West. Is that I mean, we don't we don't know, of course, but it doesn't seem that that's authorized by Putin. If he's saying straightforwardly that he accepts Islamic State's uh, claim of responsibility for this atrocity. Well, the, the, the response of, uh, of Putin has actually been quite curious from the very beginning. It was pointed out that it took him nearly 24 hours to make a statement at all. When he did, it was much less anti-Ukrainian um, than I, for one, might have expected. Um, it was much more in terms of hints and um, aspects of this rather than the main charge. And then on his second, um, on his second appearance, he said he accepted the Islamic State claim, but, and this is where, you know, this is where, as it were, the narratives, you might say, differ. He said that there is evidence because um, at least one of the accused um, said that they were paid 
And so Putin says, well, okay, fine, if Islamic State says it's behind it, but who was behind Islamic State? Who made the payments? Who orchestrated this? And this is where we get to the accusations today, which are all over one of the um, one of the Russian weeklies, um, something called Argumenty Facti, which is called Arguments and Facts, which is a very, very long-standing sort of investigative um, weekly journal, um, which has the US and the UK specifically claimed as instigators or complicit in what happened. Tell us a little bit about the Ukrainian uh, reaction to this and other other Western countries and what they've been what they've been saying in reaction to this. Well, I think you know one of the most interesting things about this is that I think unlike almost any other sort of terrorist attack that I can remember, um, it's become it became very very quickly almost immediately it became the focus of as it, almost a new front in the information war that's been going on between the West and Russia, really since the since the Russian invasion. And so immediately, I mean, it seemed to me that the, the Americans in particular were extraordinarily quick out of the blocks um, after the attack, when they said that they could that they found the um, Islamic State claim as what they said was credible, and they've been um, more supportive of the Islamic state claim since. Um, Ukraine obviously was equally quick um, to deny all responsibility because it obviously understood, as indeed did the Americans, that if there were um, an obvious Ukraine Ukrainian aspect to this, then this would be very bad for Ukraine because it's a large number of Russians killed um, indiscriminately, a lot of young people, um, and this is not the sort of thing which is going to um, enhance Ukraine's reputation abroad. So I think that there was a lot of concern right at the beginning by the Americans and Ukrainians to deflect the responsibility from them and to project it onto Islamic State. Um, and then, you know, now we're seeing gradually, gradually, the Russians are getting, as it were, their um, evidence as they would see it together um, to, to go beyond the claims of Islamic State and to see a Western hand behind it. Tell us a little bit more as well about the Russians and how, the, uh, how ordinary Russian people are dealing with this horrendous tragedy. At least 133 people, sorry, 139 people killed when four armed men, let's just remember what happened here, mm -hmm. burst into the Crocus City Hall concert complex. That was on Friday evening. 22 people remaining in a serious condition, including two children. There's going to be a national day of mourning as well. And Russian people, ordinary Russian people are really hurting, Mary, aren't they? Yes, and um, we saw um, extraordinary queues of people um, lining up to lay flowers at the uh, at the venue, and we saw with with the, with the sort of uh, the, the the jarred ruins of the concert hall behind them, because of course it had say it had been set on fire. So what's what's left is the ruins, um, and we saw long long queues of um, Russians wanting to pay their respect and uh, and lay flowers. Um, there was also. I think Sunday was a national day of mourning and they had some rather um, affecting, very simple sort of um, memori memorial, day of memorial um, insignia on billboards, sort of automatic um, backlit billboards all around Moscow. Um, which would have which would have reminded or informed everybody of what happened. What is what's hard to gauge is where we go from here with Russian sentiment. Um, obviously, there has, you know, as you say, and as we've seen, been this uh, outpouring mm. of um, sympathy for the victims and their families. How far that tra that is going to translate into fury, and how far it's being directed? That fury is now. Um, the subject of efforts to channel it um, in the direction against Ukraine. I think how successful that'll be, you know, it's very hard to judge. Yeah. 
it also seems that the Russians are you know, obviously very, very keen to dispel any idea that the Russian leadership, including Putin, was in any way derelict in their duty. Yes, of um, course. Yeah, ignoring was... warnings, um, unable to... Um, to deal with the um, with the fallout from this, so I think that you know that's another reason why the blame is now being shifted much more definitely in the direction of Ukraine and the West. Mary, thank you very much indeed. That's Mary Jeffsky, foreign affairs columnist at the Independent. Uh, Alicia Fitzgerald is still with me. And it's unsurprising, really, that there are Russians who are attempting to blame Ukraine. They're in a war situation on the West as well, even though, as Mary was pointing out there, Putin basically accepted Islamic State's uh, claim of responsibility at this horrendous tragedy. Definitely. I mean, it is quite a bizarre story, really, isn't it? That the Islamic State have very much accepted total blame for that attack, yet Putin is still trying to find a way to kind of circumvent that and very much bring the West into it. I mean, I think it all just reflects very much the sentiment across Europe and between Russia and the rest of Europe at the moment. I mean, obviously, the majority of, of countries across Europe are allied with Ukraine. Mm-hmm. And I think this is kind of Putin's just way to try and assert himself and try and make that divide even clearer between his side and, and everyone else. That's a very good point, uh, Alessia. Thank you. Um, on private schools, lots of people getting in touch on that and indeed on mass immigration and the uh, breaking news in regard to immigration statistics today as well. Uh, Mark has been in touch on text. He says, Labour on schools a race to the bottom as always. Ray in Liverpool. Not everyone who sends their children to private schools is wealthy. We had to take our daughter out of a state school because she was being bullied. We couldn't find another place in another state school so we had no option but to remortgage our house to fund a place at a private school. This happened while Tony Blair was in power, says Ray in Liverpool. Graham says, have people forgotten how the last uh, Labour government wrecked the education system? They lowered standards so much to make themselves look good kids uh, left school unemployable, says Graham. Well, uh, the uh, immigration statistics have come out again, record immigration statistics in the first three months of this year. That's something that Daniel and Epsom has given me a call on 0344 499 1000 to have a chat about. Um, Daniel, you're very welcome to the programme. Good afternoon. What would you like to say about this? Hi, Pia. Uh, do, do you know what? I think most of the population out there are living in a country they didn't ever want or ask for. Mass immigration is absolutely ruining this country, particularly mass immigration from the third world or the Islamic third world in particular. So you're to, you're talking about you're talking about uh, not just illegal migration but legal migration as yeah. well. Yeah, the thing is, Peter, when I, I'm 47, I'm from London, and when I used to get in the car with my dad on a Saturday or a Sunday, there was hardly anyone on the roads. We drive from Croydon to Catford and back. You see the odd car, but there weren't that many. We've we've added more than a quarter to our population since the 90s. I mean, Blair, we look at our country now, and he wanted to rub the noses of the right in diversity, and didn't he do a good job of it? Because now we're all having to put up with it. We've imported FGM, honour killing, sham marriage, suicide bombing, the full veil, grooming gangs. We've got people putting images on our houses of parliament. We've got violent young black gangs with knives and guns on our streets everything that didn't exist a couple of generations ago and most people in the country have been crying out we asked the conservative party and successive governments for 20 or 30 years we we've told them stop immigrate stop illegal immigration i mean white people com- com- white people commit crime too daniel no they do but i mean it's obviously you, you i don't know if you're from london i don't you don't sound like you are i'm not i'm from northern ireland I, I am, and with my eyes, across my lifetime, I've seen the place that I grew up turn for the worst. And the biggest contributing factor has been mass immigration. It doesn't matter whether kind of the, the progressive lefty types agree with me. I'm telling you, I've seen it. And mu- if you did a refer- if you had a referendum in Britain tomorrow, virtually everyone would agree with me. And the reason they would is because it's true. And I, I, I'm okay. telling you, Peter, that Peter. That, the, the Conservative Party, we gave them explicit instructions to stop illegal immigration and cut legal immigration down to low numbers. Now, they've ignored us, right? And now they're asking us to vote for them again. How can we? Immigration is ruining our lives, right? It's bleeding into every part of our lives. Education, transport, everywhere's over. Do you not think, do you not think immigrants to this country, Daniel, contribute anything? I think, so. I think if this country originally had chose the brightest and the best and people with money, people that could support themselves and were educated and they were very, very picky on who they chose, I think we'd have been okay. But what we've done instead in 30 or 40 years is just allow basically people just to flood in from all over the world, 
no checks. They haven't got any money. They've got no prospects. They're still allowed in. And, and this, is, uh, this leads us to the society we live in today where most of us live in a country that we wouldn't have asked for or wanted. And we're in it. And we're not going to vote for the... Even though I know a Labour Party winning by default, which is what's going to happen, they're going to allow mass immigration to ca- carry on. They're going to be a much worse government. I can't vote for the Conservative okay. Party because they told me they would do something and they didn't do it. OK, Daniel, thanks very much indeed for your thoughts there. Uh, Mark has been in touch already and says Daniel is a legend and he's spot on. Elizabeth has given me a call from Glasgow about the hate crime bill. Um, we were talking about that a little bit earlier. This is going to be in force from the 1st of April. What do you make of it, Elizabeth? Good afternoon and welcome to the programme. Good afternoon, Peter. Well, as far as I'm concerned, the only April Fool is Hamza Yusuf. Right. Uh, for bringing this in, or useless as we call them up here. I turned the football on last night not to watch it, but just to listen to the beginning when the national anthems were played. And it was absolutely disgusting the way they booed and jeered at the Northern Ireland singing God Save the King. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We are part of the UK. I am Scottish, but I am British and proud to be British. And not one commentator made any remark regarding this absolutely disgusting behaviour that our so-called Scotland fans project to every nation that comes and plays against them. And tell me um, what, I, I agree with you that there should be absolute respect for the national anthem. I totally agree with that uh, in all parts of the United Kingdom. Elizabeth, on the hate crime bill itself, do you, do you feel, I mean, you're saying it's, a, it's an April Fool and Humza Yusuf's the April Fool. Um, wh- what do you fear about the hate crime bill? I just think, I don't know how they're going to police it mm-hmm. in any way or if anyone says anything. The police can't come and attend to burglaries or minor assaults or anything else. So how are they going to get the resources to come out and carry on and do things like this? I mean, he was a man that came out a few years back talking about all the, the white people that were in all these senior positions. But That's right, he did mention that in the Scottish Parliament. Then, yep. Yep, would he be then pulled up about that? Yeah. Uh, it's just an absolute joke. And I'm, if I was younger, I'm nearly 70 years of age now, and if I was younger, I voted against. I don't want independence. Yeah. We would have been bankrupt if it wasn't for Westminster. But they blame Westminster and everything. It's. I would be out of this country. I really. Oh, would really? You would leave? Scotland. Yeah. Yes. Okay, Elizabeth. Uh-huh. Thanks very much for your call, Elizabeth. There in Glasgow, no fan of Hamza Yusuf. Clearly, uh, thank you to Graham, who's been in touch and says if someone earns enough so they can afford five thousand pounds a year, this is on private schools, uh, school fees, and an extra twenty percent equates to an extra eighty or ninety pounds a month. Is that really going to put them off? I seriously doubt it. We aren't talking about people living on the breadline, living paycheck to paycheck. Graham, I agree with you. We're not talking about people living on the breadline, but there are people who really stretch themselves, and that money is just about as much as they can go. It's not everybody who sends their kids to private school, obviously, but that that is there are lots of people who make huge sacrifices in order to do so. Andrew from Salisbury says that that hike for private schools is terrible politicking. It's not going to do, make a lot of difference to the Eatons and Harrows of this world, but to parents who sacrifice everything for their kids. Will this reduce the amount of scholarships? This is a taste of Labour policies to come. Watch out Britain, says Andrew in uh, Salisbury. We seem to have struck a chord, Alyssa Fitzgerald, with this private schools uh, story as well. And actually, in a moment, we're going to talk about NHS public satisfaction being at a new low. It's interesting, this question of taxation, because people often say in opinion polls when you ask them that they're happy to pay more for, I mean, the statistics bear this out, that people will say they'll pay more for better public services. I just wonder whether there's a sort of value for money argument that Labour can put forward to say, actually, your taxes are quite high already. Let's work with the money we have and let's reform them in, in for example, in health and where Streeting has talked a bit about that. Definitely. I think we saw a really good example of that was recently with the budgets where we saw another cut to national insurance. And there was lots of data and lots of polls done in the days after that that said that lots of the public actually said they would rather not have the tax cut but see a big improvement to our existing yeah. public services. So I think that definitely is a sentiment but, but, shared. But why can't... But what, I mean, the question is as well, why can't you 
Um, do both. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Why, why can't you work with the, Yeah, why can't you work with the, the money you have already? And I think know? that's a really, it's really a good point. I think we've got to this strange point in politics where we're always given these options, and it's like you're torn between between a rock and a hard place, and you're told that you can either have this or you can either have mm. that. When really, at one point and at some point, isn't the role of a politician to try and make it as good as possible? Well, to govern is to choose, ways. though, as well. You know, there's a kind of. I mean, I just think so many people forget the fact that you can get money for public services from three places. One is taxation, one is borrowing, and the third one is cutting it from other departmental budgets. And that's the only way you can get the money, but how that money actually works. And the waste in government is is astonishing sometimes. I think that's I think that final point is the key one there, really, because we don't really want to be cutting from government departments at the moment. Everywhere is quite stretched as it is. When well, um, I say I that, think... though, I'm not, I'm not sure that's the case. I think there is actually quite a lot of reform that can the... can be done. But we can, we can talk about that more uh, as the programme goes on. Lizzie is with me until one o'clock. We're going to talk about the NHS next. We'll get your reaction as well, 0344. 499-1000. Stay with us. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kingston City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Thank you to Enid, who's been in touch and says, two of my grandchildren went to private school, paid for by six different relatives chipping in. There are a lot of people who make a lot of sacrifices, not just the parents. And Enid, thanks for reminding us of that. Anne says, Labour and Education, this is the party who were shouting from the rooftops for schools to be closed for longer and longer during COVID. Well, we will certainly talk about that more as the uh, programme goes on. But And this is a big matter of a public opinion. And another big matter of public opinion is about the NHS. And there are some shocking statistics today. This is in regard to the fact that there's a big survey done 
in regard to NHS uh, satisfaction levels and only 24% of people say they're actually satisfied with the NHS and uh, it's interesting because 91% of people say they're happy for it to be uh, free at the point of use to be paid for through taxation. Now uh, we're going to talk um, to uh, Norman Warner, Lord Warner, who is a former Labour Health Minister. Uh, Norman, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Uh, I mean, uh, people not being able to get a GP's appointment is something that people talk about an awful lot. Why do you think satisfaction is so low with uh, the NHS? Well, when I was a health, resigned as a health minister in 2007, public satisfaction with the NHS was then nearly 75%. And the main reason for that was that people had access to the whole range of services. Dentistry was still a bit poor, but GP access was very good. GP uh, A&E access was very good. And what we've seen is a failure of really to get the NHS in shape to deal with the increasing demand that comes with an aging population. And we have actually worshipped at the shrine of the acute hospital and poured money into acute hospitals rather than into GPs, community services, and much more significantly, prevention. Um, because prevention is really the missing elephant, elephant in, which is a large elephant in the room, the, the lack of prevention to stop disease happening in our population. It's interesting because uh, you're talking about the ageing population. There has been a lot more money, over 40 billion extra pounds, that have gone in from 2010 when the Conservatives took power in the coalition. Clearly, this is not just about money, Norman. Oh, it's certainly not about money. Uh, but you don't you don't increase productivity and efficiency if you do so much of your work in the most expensive part of the system, which is the acute hospitals. That's why who have huge overheads, huge maintenance costs, and are not in all cases in too great shape. What we were trying to do before during the end of the Blair government was move more of the work outside hospitals into community-based services, call them polyclinics, call them what you like. But much more of that work, the diagnosis and a lot of the treatment was could be done outside expensive acute hospitals. Sure, surely that we was a lot of the... failed to deliver that. Sorry to interrupt you. Surely the, uh, the argument would have been that a lot of that moving it into the community and, and reform within the Lansley reforms in uh, 20, around 2012, that that was that the role of uh, primary care, GP surgeries essentially, and polyclinics, for example, was actually brought to be much more important. Did those reforms just not work? They, they simply haven't happened. And what we've seen is that a massive decline in the GP population. Um, we, we haven't actually got a replacement rate for GPs that matches the numbers leaving. And what we're doing is training more doctors to go to Australia, as far as I can see. So we, we've got a lot of serious problems. And you wouldn't put more money into an NHS that's in its state now with ask, without asking some pretty fundamental questions about how it's organised, how it's delivering, its productivity, its efficiency. And the people at the top are not asking those questions in a rigorous enough mm. state. You, do, I mean, it's you're, not you're, just the politicians. It's actually the managers at the top of the department. You're a former... Uh, uh, well, you are a Labour politician, of course, but you're a former Labour minister. You've earned the right to uh, give your views on the next generation. Uh, where Streeting will probably be the next health secretary of this country, what do you think of his vision? He says the NHS is a, sh is a service, not a shrine, and that major reform is needed. Do you think it's possible to get that reform? Because it seems to me that every time there is an attempt at reform, it's resisted by the system that often doesn't want change. Well, it was certainly resisted to some extent when I was in the Blair government. I'm not a Labour min member now. I'm, I'm, I sit on the cross benches in the House of Lords. I think West Streeting is actually asking the right questions. The question, as you pr rightly put it, is can he deliver this? And it's going to require getting on with the NHS unions a lot better than this government has got on with the NHS unions. At the end of the day, you can only run a decent health service with a degree of large degree of cooperation from the medical profession and the nursing profession. And that kind of relationship seems to have broken down 
where we see these rather misnamed junior doctors still on strike activity and with a lot of support for strike activity. So any new government is going to have to do some hearts and mind stuff pretty mm. quickly and be very, very clear with the NHS. My, my experience has been, unless you are clear with the NHS, you are going to make change and you carry on making change, whatever the criticism, we will simply go back to this high dependence, excessively high dependence on acute hospitals. It's interesting you mentioned the aspect of uh, being clear with the unions and having to bring the unions with you, but some would argue that perhaps they're they're too strong in the number of junior doctor strikes that we've had. Tony Blair uh, talked in terms of public service reform more generally of having the scars on his back. Will Keir Starmer and West Streeting have those scars too by the end of the first five years of a Labour administration, do you think, Norman? Well, I hope they do have some scars on their back because it will actually show that they are trying to actually produce change. What the public should have to accept is that change means they will get their services in a different way. Mm. The old model of the GP uh, handling everything is going to have to change because we simply haven't got the GPs to run things the way things used to be. Okay. And we, where streeting is right, we're going to have to modernise primary care very, very substantially. And it's going to mean hospitals won't be as close to people as they used to be. The district general hospital model is broken and we're going to have to change our, our approach. And particularly, we're going to have to work with the private sector if we want to give people more access to elective surgery. Thank the you. The private oh, sector sorry. have got capacity and we've got to buy it. OK. Uh, Norman, thank you very much indeed. That's Norman Warner, Lord Warner, who is a former Labour health minister who now sits as a crossbencher in the House of Lords. Um, thank you to him for that. Lots of people getting in touch with the NHS, including Brandon in Hartlepool. Um, Brandon, thanks for the call. 0344 1000 is the number he has called. Um, go ahead, Brandon. Good morning. Uh, sorry, good afternoon. Oh, yeah. um, I totally disagree with your previous uh, contributor. Okay. He said the, we, uh, the NHS is struggling because we've got an ageing population. That's absolute rubbish. Um, we are, in Hartlepool, we used to have a general hospital and it was closed and it was moved to Teesside and it was various people People were saying, yeah, you, apparently you need a 200,000 population to support a general hospital. That's the ratio. Okay. One general hospital. Last year, 600,000 people came to Britain net. Did we build three new general hospitals? It's more than that, 745,000. Uh, yeah. Whatever it is. But a lot of people anyway. That's why the NHS is struggling, because we are letting huge amounts of people in and we can't give them the medical cover. It's got nothing to do... The NHS is working, we are getting older and living longer because it's doing a job. But surely when you get older, I mean, that, that does put a strain because so oh, many people yeah, get dementia, I, for example. I, no, I appreciate that, but the fact is that we're living longer, so the NHS must be doing something right. What it's not doing, well, the government aren't doing, they aren't increasing the capacity, but they're letting everybody come in. But, but 700,000 some... is three new hospitals. You're, you're absolutely right, Brandon, but what, what's also a point, a sort of a side point, is that many people who are coming to this country are coming to work in the NHS and to support that service even as it exists at the moment. Look no, around any it's, NHS it's, hospital, you loads of migrants. That, that's what everybody says. We, we do, we don't it's true, have, though. Have, Sorry, it's not, of the 750,000 net last year, how many do you think came to work in the NHS? Well, I, I don't know, but what I do know is that I any NHS... I bet you it's not more than 20%. I, I, I don't know, Brandon, but what I do know is that any NHS, uh, any anywhere in the NHS that I go, I see lots of people who are migrants from other countries as doctors and nurses. That's just a fact. That's right. And, uh, and the other, so the other side of that is, why should we be taking the, the people of the, the, the Philippines trained to be doctors and nurses? Why should they come over here? The Philippines will need them. I'm, I'm very happy to have them here, um, but it's well, not I very... I appreciate it's not, that, but it's not very good on the Philippines. Well, it's not very good for the Philippines. You, you make a fair point there, Brendan. Thanks very much indeed. Really appreciate that. Um, I mean, uh, Alicia Fitzgerald is still with me, who is a uh, political correspondent of Talk TV. Alicia, Labour has a massive, massive problem on its hands in terms of the NHS. It's interesting, I, I, someone I uh, knew quite well who was 
formerly quite senior in the NHS who just said there's a crisis every week. It's just, you know, what's the crisis this week in terms of even in normal times? So given that it's under such strain and we've seen that only one in four people think the NHS is actually working, this is not a good basis for Labour going into a period of governance. Because we've had, if we think about it, previously in 97, you had a quite a good economy, Labour inherited quite a good economy, and not a terrible NHS, but actually they're inheriting, uh, they will inherit, almost certainly in November, uh, real, real problems. Definitely, and you've really seen a shift in their public narrative about the way that they talk about the NHS too over the past year or so. I mean, a year or two ago, they were very positive about the NHS whilst the government was saying, we've had COVID, we, yes, we accept that we've had really difficult times and the NHS is struggling, and there's been even potential talks about privatisation, which is something that obviously lots of the government always try and quiet, but it's definitely it's something that is discussed. Labour uh, and, always, they're, and they're using a lot of private resources, private hospital are, resources within this. And Labour during those conversations were always very quick to say, no, our NHS is really, really important. We're so proud of it. It's amazing. We're going to do our best to keep it going and make mm. it good. But what we've seen is a massive shift in that narrative. Wes Streeting, uh, especially Shadow Health Secretary, coming forward and being a bit more frank and brutal about it and actually saying, I think you quoted it earlier, that it's not a shrine yeah. and that it, it isn't this massive, you know, be all and end all amazing thing that's working really well and that actually we do need to be real and do, do something But as any it. GP will tell uh, Wes Streeting, it's one thing diagnosing the problem, it's another thing treating it. Absolutely. Nigel is in Bath and has given me a ring, 0344 499 1000. Nigel, you're very welcome to the programme. Good afternoon. What would you like to say? Good afternoon. Well, I'm a bit perturbed like, with the NHS because my local uh, hospital, the Royal United Hospital in Bath, has to pay the council 1.7 million a year in business rates. In business rates? I okay. Find, yeah, which I find if that is the same all over the country, it's like, you know, Peter paying Paul, we pay our taxes, then the council grabs it, and then we also pay them community charge as well. I didn't, I didn't know uh, NHS uh, hospitals paid... paid well, uh, I suppose it makes sense well, that they pay council tax because they're a local organisation, but as you correctly say, that's money that probably should go... Surely they should be tax-exempt and they should go into... That should go into patient care. Yeah, but why, say, why are they paying business rate? That's what I can't understand. It is very yeah. weird. I didn't know that was the case, Nigel. Yeah. We'll look into that and get back to you. Thank you, Nigel and Bath. I pre appreciate that. Um, on schools, Katie has been in touch on text and says, yes, we are talking about some people living on the bread... We are talking about people living on the bread line. This is in terms of paying school fees. Uh, Katie says, I'm living paycheck to paycheck. I'm a single mum. I don't receive any child maintenance. I only bring in £21,000 a year. My son is in private school. My son's school was founded in 1552 in London to educate poor children. About 80% of children who attend receive some kind of bursary, which is funded by the full fee paying international students and charitable donations. If this goes through, Keir Starmer will not be creating more equality. He will be stopping gifted children from poor households attending these schools. Katie, I'd be really interested if you could tell me, if you maybe text me back and tell me what uh, the, the amount of fees you pay per term or per year. I'd be really interested for that on, on what sort of bursary that your your uh, child is on. I'd be really interested. Just if you want to text me back, I'll read it out in the next section, Katie. But thank you for that really, really interesting message. Um, one person has been in touch and says, contrary to the feverish hearings of Elizabeth from Glasgow, the King is not popular in Scotland and Elizabeth, many Scots still support Scottish independence, says Mr Spoon from uh, Paisley. Well, I know information on whether we have Mr Spoon's name there. Uh, but yeah, look, Scottish independence is certainly very popular, but it's not as popular as those who want to keep the United Kingdom together. And Elizabeth is entitled to your opinion, as you are Mr Spoon, if in fact that is your real name. We'll stay uh, tuned because we're talking about uh, a couple of things, whether you should eat an Easter egg in one go and whether Alicia Fitzgerald, political correspondent, is a threat to Western imperialism. Stay with us here on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, 
that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. We're to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. We've had a great debate today on Labour's plan to impose taxes on private schools. That's been criticised. Is Keir Starmer taxing aspiration, or will he be, when he is Prime Minister, almost certainly after the next election? Brian's been in touch. He says, I don't really see private schools as aspiration. The schools, just like Oxbridge, take the wealthiest and the brightest children in the country. Well, guess what? Those people always do well in life, no matter which school they go to. I I'm not sure I agree with that, Brian, to be honest. Uh, the schools function as businesses, so should be taxed as such. If UK citizens use one of these schools to fulfil their legal requirement to have their child educated, then they should also be inspected, audited and held to the same standards as other schools. Most of them are, although there are some that fall out of that. Uh, and we've talked about that actually on my weekend programmes as well. I should say, actually, that I've been filling in for Julie Hartley Brewer uh, on Monday, yesterday and today, but I'm back on Saturday and Sunday between 10 and 1, and indeed on Monday between 3 and 4, filling in for Ian Collins, so um, please do join me for those. Anna says, I'm sorry, but we had Boris waste billions and trust, and by the time Sunak goes, you may as well add another couple of hundred billion. Money does not grow on trees, it comes from other sources. I welcome Labour's policy, says Anna. Jake says, the answer to all our problems isn't to tax the rich at every opportunity. I'm in no way wealthy at all, but this nonsense of envy politics is disgusting. Rachel says, don't aspire to have your kids be higher up the ladder. Burn the ladder. Build a higher floor. We don't need private schools. We should be striving for a world-class state education system. I mean, that would all be very nice, but at the end of the day, parental choice is uh, an aspect that I think should be preserved, uh, Rachel. But thank you so much for your message. Alice says, Labour did away with grammar schools and secondary moderns for the one-size-fits-all comprehensive schooling system. Look how that has turned out over the decades. Yeah, I mean, listen, I think we can all agree it's all Harold Wilson's fault. Um, I, I, I'm not sure... Um, that everyone would agree with that, but uh, certainly our, the state of our schools is a very, very big issue, and I'm a big fan of grammar schools. Lots of people aren't. But uh, what is perhaps a bigger question is whether Alan Titchmarsh is a similar symbol of uh, Western imperialism. Yes, really. Um, so Alan Titchmarsh, who, you know, the gardening guy, um, was on... Uh, there was a repeat of one of his programmes, in fact it was possibly illegally shown, on North Korean television and they blurred out his genes because his genes are apparently a symbol of Western imperialism. Um, I was sort of racking my brains yesterday who to get on to talk about this. And I thought there's actually there's actually only one person I want to talk about. Well, there are two people. One of them is Alicia Fitzgerald. But the one person I mainly want to talk to about this is the person who just adds a dose of common sense to any uh, sort of crazy 
uh, story, and that is Claire Muldoon, the broadcaster and journalist. Claire, you're very, very welcome to the programme. Peter. Um, I, I mean, do, uh, do you think Alan Titchmarsh is a symbol of Western imperialism? <laughs> He's certainly not an agent provocateur for Northern Korea and Kim Jong-un's uh, communist state. I mean, this is just absolutely unbelievable. Daytime TV, just picture this. You're alone, you're sitting in your, your, your flat or your house in Northern Korea. Your daytime TV starts at 3 p.m. It starts with lots of propaganda, weather, news, and the anchor is an 80-year-old woman that's known for her sensitivity and common sense. Maybe I'll be still um, broadcasting at 18. In, 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 in 60 years' time, Claire. <laughs> oh, I love it, Peter. I see what you did there. Anyway, and it's interlaced with weather and actually some historic programmes. They've got films. They've got um, historic... They've clearly got Gardener's World. <laughs> yes. but in order for, you know, the order for them to have some form of protection against the outside world, the blurred out Pete, uh, uh, Titch Marsh's trousers because denim has actually been outlawed as it's a proponent of Western capitalism, moreover, American imperialism. So, not only can we not catch a glimpse at um, Alan Titch Marsh's package, packet, trousers, we can't actually see any form of denim used in the whole state of North Korea. L let me, let it's, me. Let me, br let me bring in Alicia Fitzgerald, who's with me all day. I mean, do you think we should? it should be blurred or should we be able to see Alan Titchmarsh's seed packet? <laughs> Why would you do that? Why would you say that to me? I think I, I think <laughs> I'm blur it. I'm blur it for the people. I'm blur it it's for the people. It's what the people want. It, that, it, it, it is what the people want. Um, I, I wonder <laughs> if we can just ask the vision mixer, who's the wonderful Alicia, if we can have Alicia Fitzgerald and Claire on me all on one screen uh, just at the same time. We'll see if we can do that. Just if you're watching on Talk TV or if you're listening on Talk Radio, I'll describe it uh, to you because I want to I want to uh, show the three of us on screen at the same time. Uh, yes, there we are. Ah, so, there we are. Uh, Alicia, stand up. I'm standing up as well. And I'm showing you that both Alicia and I are wearing our jeans. We're, we're it's happy. It's too early to see that shot. <laughs> Sit down. You're scandalising people. You, usually only on OnlyFans. <laughs> um, Alan Titchmarsh is a symbol of Western imperialism. Perhaps Alicia Fitzgerald and I are too. Are you happy with your status, uh, Alicia? Yeah. It's the best I'll ever get, I reckon. Excellent, excellent. Put that right on the, the I was going to say the hinge. Put it on your Twitter bio, Alicia. Well, yeah. The yeah. LinkedIn will Twitter, do that Twitter bio, yeah, well, absolutely, <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, there's another story yeah. I wanted to ask you about, uh, Claire, is the sort of doyen of common sense. Maybe that can be your new title. Um, <laughs> apparently one NHS doctor he has urged people, oh, this is... goodness me. Yeah, yeah, this is Dr Andrew Kelso, uh, warning, yes. warning that you shouldn't eat a whole Easter egg in one go. Uh, what do you... I mean... I mean from the Sunday, NHS Trust of um, Suffolk and Essex. He's a senior doctor there. And what he said was, I mean, he should be Dr Killjoy more than Dr Kelso. Um, he's, he's warning us, you know, to take it easy this Easter. Um, what does he say? Resist the urge. Um, uh, because that we shouldn't be, we shouldn't overdo it either, apparently. And what's he talking about? He's talking about the humble Easter egg. Well, I don't know about you, Dr Kelso, but I've got my children coming back for Easter. And I can't wait to get them. But as I moaned at the time, the Easter eggs were out in the shops by what January, so they'll be they'll be lucky if they got the original ones that I actually bought them because oops, they're probably been eaten. Well, listen, these, these things happen, Claire. You know, you've got to got to keep up with all those uh, best before dates. But I mean, this is this is incredible. He advised people not to resist the urge to eat an Easter egg in one go. He said that it all adds up to a lot of extra sugar and calories and doesn't do our bodies any good. I mean, everyone I mean, knows that. On, and also, Peter, it's, it's Easter. I mean, this is you know. this is, it, it got it goes beyond nanny state. This is patronising. Yeah. People know what makes people obese what makes people type 2 diabetic. In fact, it's not only sugar that does. Stress actually makes people diabetic as well. Stress is a bigger killer. So I would rather healthcare providers actually helped people um, and society actually help people manage stress yeah, more yeah. than manage what you put in your mouth, what you drink, and what if, if you smoke. I mean, yeah. come on. We need to be autonomous for our own beings. We are in charge of our own lives. 
we certainly don't need Dr Kelso to tell us to resist the urge. Completely correct, uh, Claire. I agree with every word. Thank you very much and happy Easter if I don't see you. Happy like, Easter to you. It's a it's a wonderful festival and I know that Good Friday is coming up and a lot of people, uh, a lot of Talk TV viewers and listeners are Christians and will be going to church to uh, observe Good Friday and of course to celebrate on Easter Sunday. So very happy Easter. I'll be broadcasting over the Easter weekend on Saturday and Sunday between 10 and 1 and indeed on the Monday uh, between 3 o'clock and 4 o'clock. Uh, Alicia, have you ever e eaten uh, an Easter egg in one go? Definitely. I mean, are you, what are you meant to do with it once you've cracked it open? You, you have to eat the whole thing, right? Yes. Well, I was also going to say, shall I tell Andrew Kelso about all the custard creams that you've just eaten? I haven't been eating any <laughs> custard creams apart from four or five. The Tech Up Dave actually has been, been here in the studio today. He's not going to be happy about that. Well, he's, he's not. I want to go do a call uh, from Heather in Garvin. Um, Heather, uh, you have some common sense to impart on North Korea, I think. Yes, I want to put North Korea straight. There's nothing wrong in wearing a pair of jeans. I wear jeans every single day. I feel comfortable wearing uh, denim jeans because there's nothing wrong in wearing denim whatsoever. And you do, do, do you feel you're a symbol of Western imperialism, uh, Heather? No, it's not. It's a fashion. It's our way of life, for God's sake. We've been living our lives wearing jeans for a long time. Heather, you make perfect sense now. Long live, long live the jeans. Katie, I should say, on private schools has very kindly been back in touch. Thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, Katie was talking about her, her kid being at a private school. She says, I receive a 93% bursary. It's only just affordable, so the 20% being added is very concerning. Only boarding students can receive a bursary. Around 900 students attend boarding schools. Sorry that's too long. I just cope that, uh, that she sent me some information from the, the website on day fees are um, £7,220 a term and she gets a, a very big bursary for that but she's a single mother as she pointed out £21,000 a year and uh, she is uh, just struggling to put her kid into private school very very quick call on this from Gavin and Ipswich Gavin you've got about 30 seconds to make your point you're very welcome go ahead OK uh, similar to you uh, the other call you were just talking about our daughter's got into a private school purely on ability and we've had a bursary brilliant and yeah, yeah, and they're so misguided on what they think uh, the children that go to these schools are. So she's had a bursary to fund that. How much do you um, have to pay? Do you have to pay anything or some of it? Or We we have to pay £4,000 a year towards it, but that what? takes up all our spare money. Holidays are non-existent, etc. Um, so it's not just the rich that are going to these places and if I ever have to take her out there I'll be gutted because she's doing so well Is Keir Starmer uh, taxing aspiration Gavin? Definitely Okay, okay. Yeah. we've got to leave it there. But listen, thank you so much, Gavin. Sorry to cut you off, but we just got to go uh, because the, the, the show's over. Um, and Alicia, thank you very much indeed to Alicia Fitzgerald. Great having you on. Thanks. Was that probably the most unhinged presenter's friend you've had all week? <laughs> well, no, there's, 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 st there's stiff competition, let me tell you. Listen, thank you very much indeed to Alessia and the top team behind the glass who've made me incredibly welcome over the past three days, sitting in for Julia Hartley Brewer. Um, the next couple of days, Thursday and Friday, is Jake Berry. And next, Alex and Kev are going to be here with Crosstalk, so stay tuned for that. Thanks to everybody who sent in their messages. Sorry we didn't get to all of them. And I'll be back on Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. 
What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! <laughs> it's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, missing. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I know 